for this episode, I got my friend Dave Sherman here, the lead singer, writer, uh, and rhythm guitarist of the Martyrs. Um, I don't know if you want to go into what you do for work as well. I mean, I know you are into psychology and yeah, things random like this. things. I have a uh, educational background in psychology, but never pursued it officially. Oh, got you. Um, did I mean, got into tech stuff. Ran an uh, interactive agency, so basically designed, developed software for people. But Which explains why you can help me at such a level with this. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> uh, it's funny. When when you work in that stuff, you're never quite as adequate with it. It's like a dentist who neglects his children's teeth. So, <laughs> That's a funny way to put it. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I got into that stuff, and interestingly enough, mainly so I could have autonomy over my time to play music and stuff, which is more of a hobby. Um, yeah, now I have two kids and own some real estate and stuff. Nice. Yeah. Is that what you're mainly doing is, is like real estate investing? See, that's, um, that was a big focus for a while, but recently I started up another business with my friend I was telling you about. It was actually his, uh, kid Dean is at the Henzo school. Jesse's actually there as well. Okay. Um, Jay Moss is his name. He runs a recording studio in Haverhill, and we started a, a company called Fast Track Academy. It's online audio education. So basically, people want to learn how to record music, start their own studios, can subscribe to it, and learn how to do what Jay does. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty fun. So how? First of all, let's go into how, like what, what. Mm, pushed you to get into jujitsu because I know you have um done different types of martial arts in the past mm -hmm. um but I know you initially from training at Henzo's that's right so I fell into that because yeah I've been doing uh traditional Chinese martial arts for oh God, I want to say 16 years at this point All right. um and that that's more just for you know, health exercise, it's fun to do, it's interesting. It's a unique opportunity, too, because it's a husband and wife. Husband recently died, but they're kind of like the last of that lineage. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing that for a while, but for this, I wanted my three-year-old to get involved with jiu-jitsu. So Which is moved, awesome. Yeah, like, although we have to put him on pause, because I think he's a little too young. He's, too, he's perfect for it, because basically he was just wrestling all his friends, manhandling them. I'm like, all right, I gotta get this kid into something. Um, I searched around for jujitsu schools. A lot of my friends do jujitsu, MMA stuff, so I knew you know, the Gracie schools are obviously good. Yep. Um, when we moved up to Lowell, I was searching for stuff around there. I saw this school in Wyndham, which wasn't too far away. Took them there, and then I'm thinking, ah, maybe I'll give it a shot. And as you know, I did it once, and I'm hooked. So, yeah, yeah. It's great. So, I think I met you on, like, your first class, too, because I was cleaning. Probably, yeah, with Ty during the day or something. So, yeah, and yeah. and we hit it off immediately because we started talking about music. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's right, yeah, you're wearing a suicidal hat, and I commented on that. <laughs> yep. Like, Everybody, it's funny, because I've had, I've had a few people, like, come up to me and be like, are you okay? Like, it's either, are you okay, or fucking... Nice, suicidal, you know? <laughs> oh, oh, because it says suicidal. I would, it just doesn't even translate to me that way. Yeah, cause I think yeah I'm, I'm like, it's not a statement. It's a band. Yes. You don't, you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's a great band. You should check them out, you know. Very Try good. to get people into it. Pull them into the metal cult. Indeed. <laughs> so, on that note, um, what type of music, I already know, but for the listeners and, and anybody watching, um... What is uh the, what kind of music are the martyrs doing or uh, martyrs? I'm sorry, I I. Oh, it's fine. I yeah, added the. <laughs> it's martyrs. A, I think there is the martyrs as well, but yeah, martyrs. Um, if you mix '80s hardcore with post-punk shoegaze sound, it was kind of like this project I wanted to dive into. Got it. I think it's almost ten years ago at this point. Um, cause I come from, you know, I've been playing hardcore punk stuff my whole life and like all different types of music, but I wanted to see if those two sounds could kind of gel together. Yeah. And at the time there really wasn't anything out there like that. Um, black metal kind of does a bit of the both cause you know, it has, you know, obviously a metal foundation, but it draws a lot from punk and 
I guess we'll say the shoegaze part is the kind of atmospheric wall of sound. Quickly, um, explain shoegaze, because the only thing I can even think about is Deftones. Okay, yeah, a lot of people cite Deftones. So the, the hallmark, it, I think now it's become more of a household term, whereas initially in the 90s when it was there, it was just certain bands had that sound. The hallmark one was My Bloody Valentine, another one was Jesus ah. and Mary Chain. Um, the kind of, what, what's the word? I, I use the word hallmark sound is what they call a wall of sound. So it's like layers of, of reverb and, and uh, delay and like, you know, very like dreamy sound and chorus pedals. I think the wall of sound originally came from, uh, what was it, uh, Phil Spector, Ronnie Spector's husband, yeah, yeah. who did that sound. But you hear it in those things, it's just like this like very washy, echoey, fender twin kind of ver- verby sound. Which is wild when you think like metal and well, fenders. Here's Not really, but you well, know Well, I mean. no, it makes sense with the black metal thing. I'll, I'll try to kind of like... Cool. build the connection at least that's in my head so initially so the shoegaze thing came from the players would stare at their shoes so it was very mopey and like you know like radiohead kind of had that vibe in yeah. the beginning it's like whatever um you know fucking play on stage and don't care thanks you know, kids exactly that whole thing um very british too like uh you know like uk area which is interesting because i think like because of the only reference I really can give Deftones, I'm thinking, like, L.A. or something. Well, yeah, and, of course, American bands always draw from the Brits and, like, yep. you know, turn it into something new and exciting. And there's this kind of cool ping-pong effect that I see, at least, between the two nations kind of building on it. Absolutely. Rock, hardcore, punk music. But, yeah, Shoegaze had a revival more recently. I almost want to say it was because of that movie Lost in Translation that had my Blay Valentine and Jesus and Mary Chan. I'm going to have to check that out. It's, it's a good movie. Um, then you just start seeing it in kind of like the underground scene. It's popping up there. But at the time when I was starting Mars, there really wasn't any... There were people in... When I say hardcore too, I, I think of everything from the more like indie rock end to like the pure, you know, let's say tough guy hardcore yeah and it's it it covers the scene is different than the actual style of music which is just anything that's kind of diy underground kind of harkens back to that okay and at the time you had people who would let's say primarily play in hardcore bands starting to listen to more of the shoegaze stuff so Um, it just started to it, it, it was it was in like the uh i don't know the hearts and minds of some people, but there really weren't any bands that were mixing the two sounds. Uh, so I wanted to get that in there. Um, oh, but let's let's. I'm gonna try to draw my connection to black metal. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so the the big thing, like I said, that like kind of like wash of guitars. The the big thing with black metal is making it as harsh and intense and overwhelming as possible. So in a lot of the early stuff, you'll hear like just you know it's almost like a, a freaking storm like shh, like a lot of like uh What's that band mayhem uh yeah mayhem or birdsome was one of the original ones and uh you know the big the, the, i think thing there is being lo-fi overwhelming very like, diy exactly and i i think the sonic landscape of sh- what shoegaze kind of created work well there because it created that kind of like just ominous sonic landscape with the harsh and then the singing that like kind of like usually that like high pitch you know vampire kind of sound and then like the blast beats and everything going that was the closest i'd say um you know early on that shoegaze made its way into kind of like the punk hardcore metal area yeah and then um Interestingly, and more recently, you'd have band this band um, Death Heaven popped up on the scene. I don't know if you heard them. They're not yet, but I will. Basically, like a lot of black metal influence, but they kind of upped the shoegaze sound. They used more of like the um, I don't know, like Memory Man pedals to get that kind of like washy sound. It's very pretty sounding too. Which is so interesting and, because you when you think death metal, you don't think or black metal, you don't you think don't think pretty, pretty right? Because it's it's but the you can take. If you take like verb and delay and fuzz over it and chorus, that's what made the shoegaze bands like sound like they call it like dreamy or dream yeah. pop. It's very, it, but the thing is, you can take, you know, oh, the dream becomes a nightmare with black metal, right? 
So I think the really the sonic landscape is to create that overwhelming sound. So if we overwhelmingly you're making a feeling beautiful. with the music, exactly. And that that probably speaks to like the whole staring at the shoe. You're just like vibing with it, man. Playing yeah, and all the, the bands pedals. bands were crazy loud too. Like my blind Valentine was extremely loud live. Okay. Um, I remember they did a reunion. I saw them at Roseland many years ago, and I think they broke a record. I think they beat like Man of War for hitting the highest. Nice. I, I could be wrong, but it was fucking loud. Yeah. Um. So yeah, loud amps, lots of layers. Um. And I want to mix that with the raw drive, like '80s hardcore, you know, Bad Brains, Negative Approach, where a lot of my kind of style at its heart. Just I like more of the punk uh, influenced hardcore. So stuff that probably would draw its its roots from like British oi music, ah. and you know so usually faster beats. Um, but then the challenge was like, how do we get that layer of sound over without just sounding like mud? And you know, little by little we piece it together, and that's what Martyrs is. A lot of influences come in there, but I guess that was kind of the genesis the of base. the project. Yeah. So. Where do you guys play? Um, we haven't played recently, but the last. Jeez, the last show we played, I want to say it was like a benefit for a skate park in the South Shore somewhere. Okay. So, <laughs> well, COVID obviously threw a monkey wrench into things, but recently our drummer broke his ankle, and our bass player, I think, broke his foot as well. So we've been through a lot of this and that, but um, we have backups. So we're currently looking to play again. Like I was telling you earlier, I like playing... DIY shows, basements, VFW halls, that kind of stuff. Yeah. We've played, you know, uh, Middle East, O'Brien's in Boston, all yeah. that. But I, I really prefer to be playing, you know, the, the traditional, like, DIY hardcore punk shows. Okay. So we're on the hunt for that now. Um, as long as people's feet don't break, we'll, we'll yeah. be playing again. <laughs> Stay safe. <laughs> Try not to break any bones. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll see what you just I'm does. talking, I know, I was going to say, I'm talking to a guy who trains jiu exactly, so yeah. you never know. Hopefully, you know, nobody breaks their bones doing that. So far, so good. I've been there for yeah. like a year and a half, nothing yeah, I'm, yet. I'm all right so far. Just, just constantly painful uh, joints, but that's part of it. Yep. That's part of the ride. Um, so... What, how I mean that this is just something on my list of things to ask you. How long have you been playing instruments? How long have you been into guitar? What made you get into playing oh. music in the first place? So, God, I've been playing a long time. Um, mostly a bass player in my whole life. I actually, more recently started playing guitar specifically for this band. Did you start with the bass? Yeah. What mm -hmm. age? Um, I'd say like. 14 or 15, so yep. many years, decades. I got into music, well, there's listening to music, and then there's, like, kind of the music culture. The culture was through skateboarding. Like, I started skating Same. around nine years old, and, you know, through, like, the skate videos, the old Pal Peralta ones. Hell yeah. And, uh, oh, God, like, New Deal, all that stuff. And you hear the, it was all, like, hardcore and punk music through that. Yep. And... I also had um, a couple friends who had older brothers and sisters, so they'd introduce us to stuff like Minor Threat or you know, Bad Brains, all that kind of stuff. But when I was entering into high school, that's when kind of the whole 90s alternative grunge thing was starting to take off. Yeah. And that kind of... And, and this was before it became like the mainstream thing. Because eventually Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins. And but you were that. paying attention to the underground we, stuff. Well, we and... were just part of it, just through knowing the records, through skating and friends and stuff. So. Dude, you know, skateboarding was such a huge influence on music for me. Like, if you, bro, you, I think you're gonna feel the same way. I've heard other people say this on different podcasts. Um, uh, I was watching probably, I think it was the Nine Club. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, sure and they were I, they were interviewing Bam Margera, and he was like, "Skate videos are fifty percent tricks, and fifty percent music. music yeah. If you have They're garbage music, music fuck your video. Yeah, I'm not even gonna watch it. it. Yeah, no, it was just but the whole culture. I mean, all that kind of. If you look at the history of it, it 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 all kind of gelled together. You'll see early pictures of like the Bones Brigade guys. Yeah, like Meyer Throat when they were in town watching like the Bones were gay guys. Yeah. Skate, and, I think yeah, just the brutality of both, like the like not I brutality might be the wrong word, but because it's actually like both have like really cool 
environments. It's not like you're going to get punched in the face doing either one. Well, I think you the might. mentality comes with being part of sub and counter culture. Yeah. So naturally, when you're in this kind of offshoot of society, there's a lot it, of lost it, kids getting involved in exactly, it. Exactly. And, and that, it, because there's no map, and like a lot of people who are going to be attracted to, it's not even, I don't know if it's like a chicken or egg thing, but in, in an environment with very few rules, you're going to get antisocial types to come in or confused types, and with that's going to come intense energy because there's no you know, official uh, governing body that's keeping everyone in check. And both are very uh, masculine. Yes, you oh, know? for sure. A lot of, a lot of male energy in, in those yeah. two crowds. Yeah, and I, I know that takes kind of a different, uh, you know, vibe these days, but however yeah, you it's want not, to... It's not to say there are n- no well, great females involved in both it, of them. We'll, we'll, we'll take the whole thing out of it. Really, the energy is, it's very aggressive. Like, intensity is what rules. Right. Um, and then I, I think a lot about, it. like, DIY is what really is. Do it yourself. It resonates with me. It attracts people who value, who are very anti-authoritarian. There's also the anti... I, I like to make a distinction between anti-authority and anti-authoritarian. Right. So anti-authority is kind of silly because there are competent authorities. So, like, for instance, seemingly the black belts at our school are an authority in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Right. And we respect that because they, they seem to be proving it over and over again as yep. they... Kick everyone's ass, yep. effectively. So to be just anti-authority across the board is kind of silly. Yeah. Anti-authoritarian is against any individual or body who just arbitrarily says, we are the authority and you must follow us. This will actually segue into my psychology jam as well. Okay. We'll get into that later. Um, so I see DIY as healthy as it's saying we're not going to just follow someone or something just because they say this is the way it is. And that kind of is the other side of the coin of people who who value individuality. And to me, that's the thing that resonates with me the most, is, yeah. is finding things that resonate with you on an individual level, regardless of what people are telling you otherwise. And with that comes a very unique passion, because it's coming from within. So you mix that with the you know individuality, anti-authoritarian, um, big into self-starting. So it's, yeah. uh, we're not going to like wait for someone to... Uh, you know, what I love about the early hardcore bands. They they didn't want to be on record labels. They just wanted, like, even the early Discord stuff, like Minor Threat and all that, Ian Mackay stuff. Yep. They just wanted to document their music. That's why they wanted rec- records. It was more didn't about... Didn't have to be perfect. Didn't have to be pretty. Just to get on, on record. But it was more about playing live for your friends. There was no goal. And at that time, a lot of the kind of rock music scene was, you know, we got to get a label, move out to L.A. It was yeah. very... and and. I feel like now a lot of the music culture, sadly enough, is that. Including even, I would say, in hardcore and under underground music, it's become very systematized and corporatized, and that's probably a lot to owe to the nature of the internet and social media. Yep. Um, but anyway, DIY to me is, yeah, hyper-individual, anti-authoritarian, um, you know, What's the word? You have like, maybe entrepreneurial, big, big into self-starting. And with that comes um, a landscape where there really aren't any rules. So you obviously have the ambitious types who are starting up shows, building skate parks, literally creating skateboarding moves that never existed. Yeah. But then there's the going to be the... Rodney Mullins the, of the world. Rodney Mullins. Yeah. That, <laughs> I love him, dude. dude. I, I wish love that. someday I could sit down and just what a, pick what his a brilliant, brilliant brain. Oh, it, have you watched the Bones Brigade documentary? If you uh, haven't watched it, I think it. so. Okay. If not, I'll read. Any chance to watch? I'll go right back to it. It's just, it's unbelievable. He, so inspiring. He's done a couple of um, like podcasts, and I know he's done um, like uh, TED Talk. Oh yeah, I'd love to see it. It's phenomenal. Oh, it's, it's very just unbelievable. Dude, he's like he's like he he had to like rehab his leg, and he. He figured out like how to do it. I forget the whole story, so I'm gonna I haven't butcher heard it. it. So I'm assuming probably 99% of his own research and effort he did. Yeah. yeah, and he he like figured out how to do things in a way where like he he went from not being able to skate at all, and imagine a guy like that not being able to skate at all. Yep, it was killing him. Yeah, you know what and I he's mean. He's very engineering minded, so he he you know 
Yeah, and he, fig- he figured that injury out, and he was like, you ain't beating me. Yeah, well, he, that's, that speaks to what I'm saying about it. It's, it's yeah. the passion when it's resonating from an individual level is, it just can't be beat. And there's an intensity that, like, in both, so I think that's a better word than brutality. Um, well, it can be brutal, too. And yeah. sometimes brutality can, you know, it's, well, I guess the word implies negativity, but I know what you're getting at. I mean, it's just when you say, like, oh, this band's brutal. It doesn't necessarily mean they're but that can be brutal, you. Brutal that can also be, be very attractive. Awesome. Yeah, oh, it's, it's exciting. But that gets back Especially to the, for young That gets back people. to the young man, testosterone, and all that. Right. Like, yeah, so, and like I was saying earlier uh, about, you know, fighting, I, I was always nervous around the small guy who could yeah. handle himself. Small and quiet. So same with, like, all the... You know, female friends I had who were into skating and hardcore, especially further back when it wasn't. They like, had to be uh, even harder because it's like now you're hanging well, with. They were already probably part, and they were from like a intense scenario, and they were willing to like roll with the situation. And to me, that gave birth to something really exciting. Because someone who's gonna like muscle through the rites of passage that will earn someone respect in this space. That's some of the greatest stuff. And actually, I'm thinking, like, you know, traditionally with punk and all that, um, you know, take, like, Debbie Harry Blondie. And look Hell like, yeah. Like, one of the greatest front people of all time. Yep. Susie Sue from Susie and the Banshees. Banshees, yep, yep, yep. Like, they're some of my favorite front people. And I, I would imagine a lot of it has to be owed to playing in a space that was dominated by men. I, I wouldn't even say by design. I think by circumstance. Because right. a lot of people like Trick Truck in retrospect, like a bunch of young men who would have clearly hated to have women around at their shows. It makes no sense to decide, like, no women allowed. Right. No. It was, you know, everyone was scared, especially when it gets into the more, you know, violent aspects of music and culture. But... And then you had the different factions and groups and stuff that would all... They were all into the same music, but somehow, like... Not even somehow, just, like, culturally, they don't get along outside of a club. Yep. And they would either put their differences aside, and I wasn't around for a lot of this stuff, but or I was, and I was just too young, but yeah. they'd either be putting it aside and becoming, you know, friends in these small clubs, or they'd be button heads during the show. Well, that's, in fact, that's a very kind of traditionally, we'll say like statistically, uh, probable male bonding type of thing. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, so what I'm, and, and you have been, it's not really, this is still there. So regardless of what era, like I wasn't around for the CBGB 70s, you know, right. kind of like, scene, but, you know, we all were around these scenarios where everyone's entering into, let's say, a, a punk rock show or metal show, hardcore show. You're young, it's the first time you're doing it, everyone's nervous, everyone's self-aware. Um, your chances are you're there because you're not finding footing in any social kind of, you know, wherever circle yeah. in your high school or wherever you are. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of, in, so there's kind of like a hierarchy that, that builds itself initially. The kind of more aggressive, bigger people may leverage that probably due to their own secu- insecurities. And, yep. their, you know, but eventually, like you say, people just kind of show what they got and suddenly people are friends. So the guy who's bullying the other person, probably because they're obsessed with them in some weird way, yeah. are now best of friends. Um, but, what am I getting at here? Oh yeah, so this but this idea of having that adversity, that resistance, and passing through the eye of the needle. The ones who do that, and and I'd almost argue that people who are at the initial disadvantage are not necessarily big, they're not necessarily pretty, wherever it is that like they may be them. scared walking into they're it. Scarcely, but they keep pushing. It creates something that's unstoppable, and also the heart they need to make it through, just gives birth to something awesome. And I think about, you know, talking about like Ian McKay and Myra Threat, they were, you know, I think the, I know the word hardcore was created by the, was it the DRI guys? One of them created the word. DRI is. Um, not DRI, no. what the hell is that? It's a, um, Canadian. Anyway, I think the reason Ian McKay and all those guys use the word hardcore is because everyone's saying punk was dead. And, you know, at the time they were started, they were, uh, starting bands, it kind of was like passe, you know, but they were, I think they said, oh, we're hardcore punks, you know, we're, we're kind of, so basically they were, what I'm getting at, we're they were, they, the last they were version. considered lame, and you're doing that with something, they're like, I don't care, we love this shit, we're going to make our own, of course they made it legendary, but I'm thinking of a different story where Devo, of all bands, 
One of their early tours was with the Misfits. Yep. And you can imagine, you know, then those shows were rough too back in the day. So oh yeah. Evo, this kind of dorky band's opening for Misfits, and you got like skinheads throwing bottles at them. This is at least what I heard, and they just like played through it. Yeah. Kept and of course, surprisingly, earned respect, and they right. become this legendary band. Everybody just knows Whip It. Yeah. And that's like the last song you should listen well, that, to if that you're was getting like into the them. Hit. Yeah. I, um, I actually got into them world. through um, reading Maynard Keenan's book. Okay, yeah, he's... Because I, he's I a huge he's a fan, fan of it. His kid's name is Devo Keenan. Oh, I didn't know. That's hilarious. You know? He's really into them, guys. And uh, I I learned that... Um, I think they do a song called... I'm not, like, super well-versed in their music, but I, not, I, I got into their stuff because... Um, it So... A Perfect Circle did a song, uh, a, a cover of Imagine. Have you heard okay. that? I haven't heard that. So their video for that song was like all war footage. It was like in 2001, 2002, whenever mm-hmm. it happened. And they uh, they kind of took a lot of like footage from 9-11. They took a lot of like uh, footage from like bombings. And they took a, like very negative imagery. Mm-hmm. And they put it on this song, and it changed my view of that song forever. Because John Lennon's version of it is so, like, it almost sounds happy. It's very Pollyanna, like, uh... It, it, it sounds I think the idea, positive. Yeah, I think that he's getting at is you need to imagine this beautiful world he's talking about because it's not there. So exactly. it sounds like those guys were trying to... Put and they more emphasis on that. They shifted it to a point where, like, the music dropped down a little bit. It became, like, the music. When you change that music behind the vocals, and then Maynard has that, like, very, like, you know. Like, Ominous. It's, yeah, and, and especially, like, Tool, he does have that vibe to him. But, like, if you listen to A Perfect Circle and some of the, some Pussifer, mm-hmm. like, it's, it's, it sounds so dark. Yeah, um, that's surprising. Yeah. No, but that, that's... But they... they I'm sorry, I just oh, want to finish no, 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 that no. point, because um, I got onto Devo. But the reason I got into that is because I think I think the song's called um, A Beautiful World. Yep, that's, and that's one of my favorite Devo songs. They were inspired by that, because Devo got, like, so much shit for the, um, for the video. Mm-hmm. Um, they put the video out, and it was all, like, negative shit. And they were, like, the record label was, like, we can't do this. We can't do this. And they got they got in a lot of trouble for it. Um, so, A Perfect Circle, Maynard being such a big Devo fan, I'm sure others in the band are, too. Um, but... Oh, that was what inspired him. They, to inspi- the they were inspired by that, and he was, like, let's do that with Imagine. Well, it's, such a, it's a much more interesting piece of work, right? If if you give people what... And it's also getting to the point of these songs, right? I, my understanding of Beautiful World is kind of talking to the superficial niceties of society, but beneath it is all this bullshit that right. better be addressed. And if you're not listening, like, so... How many songs do you know, like, where... Um, like, Imagine was changed after I heard the Perfect Circle version of it, but, like, how many songs have you heard that you, as a music guy, like, you really listen to the words, and you're like, oh, this is yeah. way different than now, I like, thought it was going to be. I don't know if it's in the words. I'm not a massive Beach Boys fan. I respect them. But, that, you know, this the music's all... We could even hear it in the tune itself. On At the lowest resolution take, I imagine most people take it, I'm like, it's a good time going to the beach. But beneath it, there's... Even in the sound, there's something lurking there. And I know the story beneath them is pretty dark. Yeah. So I, I think that's just very interesting. All the Charlie Manson stuff. And... It, it, exactly, yeah. And that that, that, that imagery is cool, too. So, oh, there's the San Francisco. It's like, you know... Going, there's a lot of love. Really beautiful and flowers beneath is just cults and yeah. stabbings Drugs. And, and all this bullshit. Um, another band that comes to mind is Bell and Sebastian. It's very, like mod 60s pretty sounding music but the lyrics are all really like intense and dark yeah that's that's fun it's interesting um how do we even get on it doesn't matter oh devo that's how yeah but yeah so again i guess we're talking about kind of like these contrasts how they create very interesting things so you have devo on a certain you know especially you know looking in hindsight like what would devo is a punk band that makes no sense punk rock is you know liberty spikes and you know, Sex Pistols and all that bullshit. But they were unique. But that's the thing is that is the true punk. It's it's being 
back to DUI being an individual, anti-authoritarian, self-starter, and just taking no prisoners, just keep going. And in that space, if you take on the challenge of going against the resistance and finding your footing, chances are you're going to not only make something very interesting, it's going to be something that other people respect. If nothing more, even if the end product isn't very good, you're going to get respect from the genuine participants of this culture for, you know, walking the walk. That's really what it's about. It's about walking the walk. It's not about the end product. So as, like, I grew up listening to a lot of thrash. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like the main staples. You got, like, Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, Anthrax. I never really got into Anthrax. I respect them, but they just weren't as intense to me. Um, No, they were a little more fun. and Yeah, yeah, party band, you know. But they they were badass, you know. Slayer's kind of that's the uh well then i showed you power trip that's kind of carrying the torch that's pantera yeah you know and i came along like after these bands were already huge you know um i was born in 93 so it's like by the time i was 9 10 11 like i start like i i initially started with like bands like corn and manson and Mm -hmm. slipknot and that you know my mom ended up meeting my stepdad and he was like an old thrash Guitar yeah, player and, and then shit. You see where a lot of that I heard Slayer through. in his truck, and I was like, "What the fuck is this? I need this in my life." Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but being from that type of energy musically, um, my big problem with punk music is like the idea. I've I've my brother's pretty deep into the scene. Um, and I, I've heard people, like, talk shit about his vest before. Like, he's... he's. There are so many rules that's where it's like... That's, and that's what I said. That's so, not, I, well, case in point, Slayer is the reason... Thrash is the marriage of metal and punk. And particularly, I say, hardcore. So yeah. you'll see, like... Uh, yeah, you'll see, like, the guys from Slayer wearing, like, Dead Kennedy shirts and stuff like that. Yep. That's the speed, that's the intensity, that's the DIY stuff I'm talking about. There's punk and punk rock as and even hardcore that are as an image which whatever it is what it is and that that's kind of like the weird juxtaposition in these cultures there's people for better or for worse find their their way into these spaces it may not even be a music where again they're 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 they just value being an individual they want to chart their own path they want to express themselves in a way that they feel is unique and they're also just not into mainstream culture, into countercultural stuff. And there can't be a uniform, there can't be a look for that person. And then there's people who like the aesthetic and like, they like all the benefits of being different, having an image of being different, but they're not committed to being an individual. And those are the ones who will collude together and wear the same clothes. Be a fucking listen, gatekeeper. Listen to the right, exactly, and then tell, but again, it's, kind of behooves a person who's getting bullied by those if they're going to play the game in a way that works that's in a way they're doing that person a favor they're giving them the resistance yeah to keep doing wearing whatever clothes they don't like now if that person breaks chances are it wasn't resonating well with them if they don't break then whatever they're putting on or wherever they're playing wherever they're however they're expressing themselves is something that's powerful enough to break through a pretty kind of weak barrier at the end of the day. It's just a bunch of people talking shit and, and kind of uh, behaving in a very hypocritical way. Yep. You know, we're the different people who all look the same. So and that's, it's a cliche. So that was my point to him one day because I remember when he started getting into the scene, it was a lot of that gatekeeping mentality. You know, and it was weird because it's like, it's like we're not even in a place where punk rock is like huge, especially in this like time, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because I'm talking like maybe 10 years ago. You're in New Hampshire or Brockton? I believe he was in New Hampshire at the time. Um, That's where Gigi Allen's from, though. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) you know, but it's like... we case in point, you talk about someone who was, him and his brother taking no prisoners. (laughs) I I was in Brockton, he was out here, and I came out, and I remember, like, because, like, I would would just come visit once in a while, and uh, I remember, like, hanging out with a couple of his buddies, and... They they would say things like, um, you know, did you put those spikes on yourself? And he's done everything himself. Like he's very artistic. He's he's. Um, oh, no, I I met him. You've seen him, so yeah. No, yeah. He's, he's, and he's been like that 
since he was a little kid. Not surprised. You know, before he oh. even got into punk rock, he was putting fucking things in his ears. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, but both of you are expressing yourselves. It's not, it's not a choice. It's just, you're just doing, like, the fire is burning so strong, metaphorically speaking, that no matter what anyone else is throwing at you to kind of discourage it, it's, if it's resonating, that, it, it's not comfortable, because it's not, like, I think we're talking about the whole idea of us believing we need others' approval, mm-hmm. um, which is an irrational belief, but wanting approval is good. We all have that, so when we're being shot down for our choices, it sucks, but yet we keep doing it. Right. And that's because there's something just more meaningful inside. I also look at it, like, especially coming from a musical background, um, I don't even like saying that because I don't know shit about music, but as far as, far far as, as, uh, you know, coming from loving metal and all this other stuff, I, uh, I, I almost enjoy when people don't like something I'm doing, not in a way where like, haha, I'm annoying you, not like that, but like, if, if, if people are out there not liking something I'm doing as a project, it means it's working. Yeah, well, yeah, you're, or at least you're on the right path for trying to carve something unique. Yeah. Especially if we're in counterculture, subcultural music, because everyone knows when you get into any of this stuff, at first, most people hear it and are like, what the fuck is this? And that's what took me so long to figure out, is that, like, that idea of when someone's like, hey, uh that guitar part you did, I really think you should put this here and that there and this there and that there. I'm like, fuck you. Like what I, this is mine. Yep. This isn't yours. I'm not, I'm not asking you for your approval. That is punk. You know? And so this is where I was going with that is like, I don't look it. I don't necessarily sound it. My brother has told me before, you're a bigger punk than anybody I've ever met in my life. Cause he's like, punk isn't a look. He's like, you literally just have this I don't fucking care about what you think attitude. And I don't get me wrong. I care about what people think about me. I care about what my friends think about me. You know, if you think I'm a shithead, I'm going to be upset. primitive creature, you're, there's no way you can't. Um, it's just in our, in our... But I remember saying to him, he actually showed me a movie, um, SLC Punk. I don't know if that's like... Yeah, I actually like it a lot. It, it communicates exactly this. So he, sh- he showed me that movie because I said something to him. And he was like, have you ever seen this? And I was like, no. And, but, so, everybody was, like, commenting on his fucking patches, and on his vest, and on his shoes, and on everything, dude. And I was like, you know, for a bunch of people that fucking take pride in being unique, they're all wearing a uniform, just like the police, yeah. just like fucking you do at a job, just like everything else, and they're enforcing the uniform. That's not punk. And he goes, I gotta show you this movie. Yeah. You know, and we watched it, and they, like, literally almost that quote is in the movie. Yeah, I think it's the girl he's dating points out, like, you're wearing a uniform. Literally just that. Yeah. And and then he becomes a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing is, it's... And, I mean, let's give the devil to it. It's normal, especially when it's younger people. Or, younger or not, it, people trying to figure out the world. It's all right if people want to wear a uniform. I mean, yeah. It, it's uh, what we're. But don't be so anti-uniform it, well, and also be fucking enforcing yeah, a strict dress code it's policy. Hypocritical behavior and the reason I'd say even the people you're describing for the most part won't like is because it yields stuff that's just not interesting. Yeah. And it's just like the last yeah. fucking but thing you, I heard. But in a weird way, you need all these forces there for again this like kind of resistance, and this actually speaks to I think it's shifting now, but. A lot in the, the, the cultural landscape is this idea of removing all the adversity and resistance and, and the, the unsafe spaces and all that. I get the natural hunger for that because, you know, we're creatures of comfort. We want to kind of find this imagined land, this utopian area where we can just return to the Garden of Eden. But if we're talking about punk, it can't exist without that resistance and that's going to be pushed back because otherwise how can you i mean you can't you won't know if you're an individual if you're not it's not even necessarily always negative feedback it may just be confusion yeah it may just be like or genuine like yeah i'm just not digging it like i get what you're going for and that may be good feedback on on its own because if your interest is to present something artistically that not only allows you to express yourself, but if you're performing for other people, you want to reach them too. So you do have to walk this fine line of how to 
provide something that impresses upon other people, it still doesn't violate your integrity. And that's something that I think a lot about when I write my music. Um, and as much as I hate to talk about it, I think it's relevant for this moment. I think of three rules, as particularly with Martyrs. It's, I call it like big, catchy, and powerful. Yep. So the big part is actually that shoegaze layer, something that like when you hear it, and I'm, I'm mainly focused on live sound, that when you hear the, the sound, hit, it, it just hit washes you. over. It's like, a, you know, when, when you go, it just, you're like you're swimming in it. The powerful is the intensity. Um, my vocal attack, it's, it's very uh, influenced by, in a weird way, Americans were influenced by British oi music. I love British, but like someone like Ian MacKay, a joke from Slapshot, they have a lot of that sound in their vocals. So mine, it's very, it's melodic, but it's still very harsh. Yep. Um, and then like, you know, we're playing, playing. I don't, it's just, you know, hardcore punk. It's intense music, so that's powerful. Slamming strings. The catch. Flash beats. Exactly. No, it is a flash beat. It's just, it's, it's, it's punk. Um, but then the, the catchy part is tricky. So I write, like, I love hooks. And I think this actually was a big part of, of British oi music because it was meant for like singing along, catching, but it, you can very quickly fall into a trap of writing for other people and not yourself. So I'm trying to write stuff that First of all, it's catchy to me and my band where we're like humming in our heads. It's it's sticking with us. That has to happen first where it really resonates with us. And then I want it to be, um, let's say judged for lack of a better word, by the crowd. And I'll look. And if they're not feeling it, it's not working. Not because I want to purely cater to them, but I want something that brings us both together. So something that resonates with me and the crowd. And that's a very, it's a tough line to walk especially because it's much easier to just listen to what everyone's digging now and just kind of like and the formulas are all there yeah taking that in and doing it so like what comes to mind is like starting a dv pan the formula has been there since the beginning since like discharge of the verrucas there's not many moving parts you could figure out what like the top ones everyone's listening to Set up your band that way, and you're gonna have shows. And again, you gotta look the part two, where the proper patch is, and blah blah blah. Yep. Uh, and chances are, if you're doing everything right, you're gonna play shows. People are gonna be, you know, jumping off the stage and psyched, and you're gonna get that approval from the crowd. But is that really what you wanted to do? Chances are not with a lot of bands, because it it's becomes derivative. Yeah. But if you're going out there trying to get that same reaction with something that resonates with you, that's a very hard thing to do. So it, what am I getting at? So I guess I'm putting pressure now on the individual. Be careful to not become so in love with being different that you're isolating yourself because we still want to connect to other people. Otherwise, we're just playing music for ourselves in our own room. So, but that, that to me is a much more honorable and interesting venture because you're going to meet a lot of failure because you're, Again, Devo is probably one of a zillion bands who actually didn't survive. <laughs> right. The bottles being thrown out their head, they probably were done after that. But my guess is they just knew what they were doing. Just something in there was like, no, what we have here. I mean, the fact that they were on tour with Misfits at the time at their prime showed that they were doing something. And Yeah, you don't just get let in on things like that. And it's, Somebody has to see something in you. Because you, you'd expect so many other bands to be in that spot that would be expected. Right. But the Devo Misfits is so left field. So awesome. Like that's um yeah, I don't know, that's what just does it for me. But uh yeah, I think I'm getting too tangential. But I think you know what I'm at. It's, it's the you know, walking the path of of an individual, I think it's important to have that resistance there. And yeah, this modern idea of you know, removing the problematics and creating safe spaces is doing a disservice to people who yeah. just value a sense of themselves that just isn't common. There is no individual problem solving. You don't have a fucking obstacle, then you can't figure it out, you know? Not, and then no. if you don't figure out these little puzzles as you're growing up and moving along, you're not going to figure out any of the big ones. And I even thought, ironically, you'll end up becoming more predictably mainstream because you'll fall in an echo chamber in a bubble. 
and then you become that group of people you're describing picking on your brother. They right. think they're the outcast and the, you know, we're not wearing a suit and whatever. Just we're another not, group. If anything, that to me is more disappointing than the people like, you know, I I tried listening to punk, but like I like mainstream stuff and. There's nothing wrong me, with that. There's a lot of great well, mainstream stuff. It, it, but, but the thing is, in mainstream, what well, I'm describing is someone who's just gravitating towards what they genuinely feel resonance with. Right. And it's the same goal as what I'm describing. What, we're just talking about a landscape of where people who just naturally aren't digging that end up in this other area. It doesn't make them any more or less special. Yeah. It's just they're 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 entered into a completely different game without any rules because it's not mainstream it's uncharted territory and with it comes that you know brutality and harshness that we're talking about because it, it's it's the they're the pioneers they're the people i think that's out. a disservice to yourself if you're in that kind of scene to be like against anything because at the end of the day not anything you know you know as long as you're not hurting people mm-hmm. but musically to be against anything um like, I remember being drawn to, like I said, like bands like Korn and Manson and Slipknot and mm-hmm. all those, like, 90s... Uh, the, the new metal stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I remember being drawn to that in the same exact way I was drawn to Metallica, in the same exact way I was drawn to NWA by the time I was yep. 13. Oh, perfect, perfect. Um, and, and, you know, like, now, it's like, I've, I even... I, I used to argue, I had the dumbest fucking argument on the planet with my father when he was still here. Um, we'd argue about Metallica, which era was better. And mm-hmm. I was like, no, you gotta fucking listen to Kill 'Em All. You gotta listen to Lightning. You gotta listen to Puppets. You gotta listen to uh, uh, Injustice for All. Yep. Th- those are the four that only matter to me. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you know what? Like, he his thing, he really didn't love... He lo- he liked Master of Puppets. I could get him into that because it started being a little bit more melodic. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Cliff helped with a lot of that. Like, he was very well uh, uh, versed in all types of music. You know, he came from, like, Love oh, and Leonard Skinner. And, and that pop sensibility that I was talking about. Yeah. Like, and, uh, the and then after that was Justice, and it was just like... Bah, 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 yeah. Fucking s- killing everybody with speed. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, there's, trust me, there's nothing wrong with that. I love it to this day. So but, was he more, like, black album post? Yes. Cause it, well, then they became a more sophisticated band, for lack of a better term, which... When... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, go, go, go. go. I'll, I'll talk forever. When he... He heard, like, black album on the radio, and he was like, that I like. Mm-hmm. Um, once Hetfield started singing a little bit, it was instead of just being, like, fucking hard charging on the mic and, and it's sounding just like he he's like I can't even understand what he's saying what the fuck is this guy saying yep. you know um, as opposed to me where I got like I was into suicidal at the time like still am but like you know like uh, my big bands at the time were like Slayer Metallica Pantera yeah, Suicidal DRI I wanted to just punch you in the face fucking brutal fucking just thrash um, and I was skating at the time so it was like that was just driving my love for skateboarding and like when you're listening to DRI or Slayer or Exodus or, yeah. or fucking Venom or something like that when you're Venom, you're right. you're skating you're like fuck it I broke my foot doesn't matter like you like it makes things just you want to be more intense as a human being yep. and tougher and, and you know no it's it's about the energy there yes yeah. and, and I then, was, well, it sounded like your father wanted more of the artistic side the experience the he wanted to aesthetics. listen to something. Yeah, and the aesthetics of it. Yeah, and he was cool. over his whole fucking fighting, you know, phase and all this other stuff. Like, yeah. he wasn't a kid anymore. He was, you know, no, in his it. early I mean, 30s. That, that's, that's what I look for always when I mean is to find those two tension points. That's the the catchy and the powerful stuff. Yeah. Like, the, the powerful is what you describe. It just, it takes you over. It taps into that reptilian brain. It's visceral. You have no choice. Actually, I think of, like, uh, you ever watch Chappelle's show at all? Love it. Like, you ever remember that episode where he's, where he's doing, like, the different beats? He's like, do the fight beat. The like, white people and the yeah, black exactly. people. Yeah. That's, that's, that communicates that. It's like, it just, it sets you off. And it doesn't matter. It, it's, you know, tapping into something ancient in us. Yeah. It's tribal. It's primal. Primal. Exactly. That's the word I was looking for. So that, that. John yeah. Mayer was great in that. Um, oh, <laughs> that's hilarious. They did, they did the fucking different Strokes theme song at the end. But, uh, oh, yeah, so the, 
yeah, tapping into that primal thing. And this can be done not even necessarily with, like, loud or intense music, but it's just... And then there's the thing your dad's resonating with, what you're describing, is the catchiness, which is way deeper than it sounds. It's just there's certain, you know, aesthetics that, that just stick in our head. Yeah. And it... it I guess it's kind of touching to that primal part, but it, it, it's, I guess it's more in the creative realm. It's, it's creating something you haven't heard before or else it wouldn't stick there. Cause, but people know. have that brand loyalty. Like, I'm not smoking Newports, I'm a Marlboro guy. And it's like, fucking, they don't want to hear soft Metallica, yeah. well, it's, it's, so to it's, speak. It's, we, yeah, we don't like uncertainty. Change. Yeah, change and uncertainty is, is understandably... Uh, counter to our DNA, because that, that causes a lot of problems for people. Right. Um, yeah, things changing and things being uncertainty. So, on the same topic of change, um, once he passed away, it was more, like, dude, I was listening to, like, fucking way different stuff. Like, he, like, lately I've been listening to Super Tramp, like, Take the Long Way Home, and, uh, oh, okay. like, th- I'm getting into that stuff because yeah. of... His passing, like, I grew up with him listening to Bee Gees in Boston and fucking, yeah. like, you, like, he's a very 70s, or was a very 70s, like, oriented uh, musically. Yep. But he was fucking huge into music. Like, I, I remember, uh, like, one of my, literally one of my earliest memories, I've talked about this on the podcast before, um, I remember him singing, um, like, Dr. Hook songs and stuff like that, um, while doing whatever, you know, like w- being in the tub or something like yeah. that. And he's singing Dr. Hook and probably stoned out of his fucking gourd. <laughs> um, but, like, I, I can remember th- those things. And now uh, that he's gone, that's how I'm remembering certain things. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, so, to get back to Metallica, um, I always was like, no, fuck those albums. They're, they're uh, not for me. Not for me. Just early stuff, early stuff. Yeah. And then uh, I started listening to uh, Load mm-hmm. because that was literally like one of his favorite albums. I remember him trying so hard to get me into that as a kid. Um, and it came out when I was, I think, three. It came out, I think, in 96, 97. Yeah. Um, and he initially got me, um, He or told us to, and it, I hated the fact that they didn't have long hair anymore and all that stupid shit. Um, you know, they look like, I think I heard somebody say now all of a sudden they look like Cuban pimps, you know, like (laughs) smoking cigars and shit. They're all smoking weed and it's like, what the fuck is going on with this thrash band that I love? They're changed now. They're adults. Oh no. Um, but he got me into, uh, what's that fucking song? Um, can you hear your babies crying? Is that, I, I know Um, very little of Metallica. I know the black... I Alan literally, Turner. I can play the song, and I can't yeah. remember the name of it, because I, I have a terrible short-term memory, but, um, he got me into that song because he was like, you know, this reminds me of you guys, and it's a song basically written about, um, your kids going away from home and finding influences other than their parents. Um, this is actually, this is getting my wheels spinning, so I may have to unleash for a second, I hope, I think it will resonate. So, what you're just, what I'm hearing you describe is approaching music for the aesthetic, musical aspect, which mm-hmm. sounds like that's your dad. And there's a cultural aspect to it, but he, really the part of his brain that's really is, I'm here for the music. Yeah. And that's He's very a important. very word-oriented listener. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, like, that's a big part of the would, aesthetic. His I want to know thing what they're saying. Was, I hey, listen to the words. We're coming from the cultural part about skating it's identity it's yeah that feeling it's visceral it's older it's tribal it's primal and now the two do live together because it's not like especially as you get older and you start kind of picking your bands it's it just gets kind of like to walking that fine line and i think like the aesthetic part is the catchy part it's really focusing on forget about how they look who they are what their story is like what is coming out of that speaker? Yes, and that's that's really important. And that to me, that's that's something that I focus heavily on music because it's easy when you're in hardcore to lean on the tribal part, focus on the beats, you know, 
You just, yep. oh, yeah, yeah, we're good, we're good, we got it. <laughs> Nailed it! Again! <laughs> you know, you yeah. know, but, like, that's easy. That's, that's all, that's, that's the Caveman old stuff. shit. That's Old Testament, that's orthodoxy. You can fall, because it's just there. The form is in there for her. But then, like... To build on that. Well, how do you make that, you know, how do you get to that higher part? Where so okay yeah so I'm thinking of like someone conducting a sermon you read just like reading the Bible verse or whatever faith it is that's only like just gets people going because those words were you know a product of you know centuries of social evolution they wouldn't have lasted if they didn't you know strike someone's fancy yeah but then there's like the timbre of the preacher that's adding the that color to too it. that's that's almost paramount that's that, to really bring it to that. And I'm not even talking about literally in a religious sense, uh, you know, traditionally or, or, or uh, even spiritual to apply. Like, uh, to reach that kind of, like, higher level, you need that thing that's coming out of the speaker. And it has to be devoid of what the culture is. It's it's universal. So, yeah, that's the part that really appeals to me. And, and case in point, when I listen to music, I, I don't actually listen to much hardcore punk um, you know, I, what do I even listen? I mean, I, anything that sounds good, and I have to. And change. that's how I feel now. Yeah, and that's that's important. Now the two can when the two come together though, where there's a culture there, and then they lock it in. It's something that just can't be touched. Uh, what comes to mind is to me Ian Mackay, you know, Minor Threat, all that that history. That's kind of like my shit. That's to me the. Rodney Mullen, Tony Hawk is a skateboarding, and Ian McKay is hardcore. So he goes from Minor Threat to a band Fugazi in the 90s, yep. and that's when everything came together. And interesting of that band, I remember in it which he was saying, I wanted to write a band that could be played in an arena, top 10, but it's going to operate like a hardcore band. Everything is... And that, this is a big picture guy. Yeah. And and I got and like to me that's what always resonated with me is what's rooting me always is the culture because that's that that hits me on the deepest. Just hearing good music, it's fine and all, but that doesn't get me on my core. It's it's the meaning. It, it's yeah. There's just like something in there that it, it's cultural for me. It, it, and to me, I think it's more about the community of individuals getting together and showing what they got and being excited like it's that jubilee that yeah can't you can see it obviously at a um you know an arena pop show and it's there that the feelings there but that deeper significant it, it kind of that will dissipate once you leave the arena whereas the cultural the visceral thing i'm talking about that could be there whether you go to the show or not, whether you're in a basement watching a, a band's play or, you know, VFW Hall, that you can, it, it's tapping into something deeper. But when the two come, like the, the aesthetic that gets people into the arena and that, it's unstoppable. Right. Um, so, yeah, you have to kind of put on different hats. So what you're describing is, all right, I'm going to listen to Metallica now, not for like the what's going to get me into berserker mode, but what's going to sound Resonate. awesome. And that's cool. I, a band that comes to mind is, uh, in my last band, uh, two of the guys in my band were younger, they were really into AFI. And, <clears throat> and they, they I just, remember them. And, and AFI, actually, they were, you know, Bay Area hardcore, legit from the scene, worship misfits, kind of did that whole thing. But they eventually became much more sophisticated. They, I forget, the, they did their Black album or something like that. The, the hit with like Ray Silk Green or something. Anyway, the the guy the the we call them the kids in our band were really into it, and the tribal part of my drummer I lay like fuck that we're not touching this lame like main big label mainstream DreamWorks crap and yeah. it's so silly, um and like I was less that than the drummer because I I let, you know I can listen to music for music's sake but something. I guess we were more productive. We didn't want our band to be even be touched by any of that stuff. Right. We wanted to be very orthodox and. You're gonna taint our sound. Yeah, but <laughs> out of a gesture of uh, good faith to my um, two guitarists, I gave that record a listen, and I listened through the ears of the the you know the music brain, not the trial brain. I was like, wow, this is really real well written. It's hard really to do catchy. that too at first. Yeah, well, because people get stubbornly caught, and I, I think I've always. 
I guess the best way to describe or how I see myself, I don't, and this isn't by choice, I don't find myself really fitting into any tribe. Same here. I'm not, and I'm not interested in that, but I love being amongst people. Yeah. And obviously my, a lot of my musical and aesthetic in, interests fall in counter and subculture. But like a lot of people I know who are from that world, most of my relationships aren't in that space. Yep. Um, and again, not necessarily by choice. I just, I'll hang with people. And I like that. Um, so it's not hard for me to take in aesthetics through that music lens. Because I don't feel like I'm losing a part of myself or I'm betraying some tribe. Because I'm not part of any of that. I'm just kind of doing my own thing. And, and if it happens to resonate with a certain kind of cluster of people who are collaborating together, great, we can talk shop, and if not, whatever. You know, yeah. they, they need to see certain symbols or markings on me to be happy. Ultimately, their loss... Oh, well. It, as long as I have something to offer. If I have nothing to offer, they're gain. You know, right. good, the good thing they put their sigils up, because it kept me the fuck out of their party, <laughs> and I probably would have pissed all over it. Yeah. <laughs> but I think more often than not, when you do that, it's kind of weird thinking about it, like using those sigils to ward off people i think they're more often warding off people who could contribute something positively than not um case in point throwing bottles at devo's head so (laughs) yeah Um, they could have they could have actually pulled some good influence out of their writing in yeah it's it's true but again it's that fine line if you're gonna be preserving something that has to be unique there is you need to gatekeep because if Everything cool floods point. in, it becomes gray. But you can't close the gate too tight to the point where all these interesting colors that could get into your palette can't make it through. Um, or you know, then there's that thing, like, you need the gate tight enough where the, the really special stuff can, like... There's enough for them to wedge their way in to fight through. That's the Devos for when they get in. It, it brings it, like, lights it up. Right. So... Yeah, I'm getting super tangential again, but yeah. No, but that, that I, love that I love it. I love it because I'm, uh, I'm. That that's, that, that's what goes through my brain. I I look for that. I'm excited by that stuff. Yeah. The, and wherever it is, it doesn't matter where it is. You just know it when you see it. It's so like, that's actually what got me, more, like. My love for my dad got me into the newer stuff from from Mattel because I was like, all right, fuck it. What did he love so much about this, right? And I did remember the name of the song. I'm just fucking scatterbrained. Um, it's Hero of the Day. Oh, I remember the name. I couldn't tell you how it sounds, but I know that's like one of their um, more modern. I guess that's not even modern anymore, but more modern. <laughs> no, it's still 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but, Amazing. yeah, um, I just, I started listening to that album more and more and more. Now I love it. Now I love, like, Load, Reload. I don't love everything off of it, but I don't love everything off of all of Suicidal's albums. I don't love every, you know, it's, you no, pick your favorite you stuff. Need to. Right. It is what it is. You don't need to love it all. Um, but, um, avoiding going on a tangent myself about something I've already talked about here, uh, I was w- listening to them talk about their influences on that album. Um, and I get a lot of people like, cause I do, I love playing Pantera. I love playing all those like classic, just fucking punch you in the face metal bands. Mm-hmm. I love that shit. Um, and I get people that are like, you know, I, I'll play like collective soul. I'm learning shine from collective yeah. soul right now on the guitar. It's actually fucking a lot harder than you'd think. Yeah. It's not surprising. Usually those songs sound so simple and you look at the, Wherever, if you're doing the tab or the music, you're like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm learning right now from uh, videos. I like I'm doing a com- combination of this dude Carl Brown and if anybody's a guitar player, go watch his shit because he's fucking awesome. Um, and Ben Eller, like they both do the solo, mm-hmm. and it like, dude, it's like based off of. I won't go too far into this because I'm going on another tangent, but. Um, it's based off of the pentatonic scale. Okay. Like and the, the blues kind of... Yeah, and where did, where did Dime get a shitload of his stuff? Oh, that's all... Yeah, Dime was all blues. Yeah. And that's, that's and like it's southern like, rock, metal. That's their whole kind of... Aesthetic. Nailed it. So, yeah. Collective Soul is from Georgia. Okay. Um, they're very southern, um, and they're very bluesy. 
Yeah, um, I mean, they like down, 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 down. Yeah. Very, yeah. Um. So, I heard that solo one day, and I was like, "Wow, that sounds kind of like fucking one of the runs I I learned when I was doing the walk solo." Mm-hmm. And I'm like, "Fuck it, now I gotta learn that." You know what I mean? But it's like I have people like, "Ah, oh, fuck that band. Oh, it's not metal." It's like, "What do you care?" Like it doesn't like so. First of all, it was I was watching the uh, the. Guy, I don't know if it was the guys from Metallica talking about it, but I, I was listening to some of their influences on doing Load. Because mm-hmm. it was so different than, like, even Black Album. Like, it still is a little it's heavy a, moving forward, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, some, like, Metallica-esque jams. And yeah. It's heavy and intense and dark and all that. Right, so they totally switched it up for Load. And reading the influences that they had, it's like... Alice in Chains, Alanis Morissette, fucking... That's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. That, to me, like, the second I heard Alanis Morissette, I was like, you know what? It's always been, like, a guilty pleasure of mine. I fucking yeah. love her music. Um, yeah. And it's because it's not... It is this mainstream kind of thing, but it's also, like, got well, this, yeah, like, it's, Joni it's, Mitchell well, thing to it. Well, the thing is, it's it. fighting against the culture ring, because, the, like, you're not... Chances are... Well, I guess it depends. I get, let's say Alanis Morissette in her heyday, you're not going to find as rewarding of a social experience attending an Alanis Morissette concert if as you would if you went to, like, the vulgar display of power towards yeah, Pantera. Yeah, right. Like, that primal brain would have been, like, you know, at 1% at the Alanis Morissette. Right. <laughs> Maybe every time, like, she started playing a jam and the crowd laughed, like, oh, I feel it. And I went back down, like... I, I can tell you, so when I saw Pantera play, it was, I think it was Roseland, New York, and, the, like, literally the first note, every single, I, I swear, I think every single woman in that place went to the basement. It would, like, <laughs> it was... They were like, we gotta get the it, fuck out of here, this is crazy. It was, like, the, the first note was, like, the, I don't know, pressing a button to unleash, like, the, open the gates of the boats in Normandy, and everyone just flooded out. It was bananas. Yeah, I wish I could have seen them in their fucking heyday. We very much enjoyed it. <laughs> Man. Um, or, or for that matter, they well, they still had like the old Long Island hardcore shows in the nineties. It was even crazier than that. It yeah. was just very male energy, as we described it earlier. But and you got guys like fucking knocking each other out and fucking picking each other up and hugging each other well, after. Well, in that case, there were many hugs, but yeah, that, that not was, much more nowadays. Wait, but. Well, that was what I found when I went to Boston because the uh, when the hardcore scene, I'd say around '96, kind of reinvigorated itself. It was the youth crew scene was really big, which was the '88 sound, like uh, Gorilla Biscuits, Youth of Today, all that. Yep. And that was very posy. So there was, you know, knocking each other around, but you pick up, you hug it out. It's, um, yeah, and it, you, it's not the the tough guy stuff was at its most extreme. It was just, you know, biggest man wins or most powerful man wins. The, like the older Slayer shows where people were walking around with fucking pigs' heads on sticks and shit. Yeah, yeah. and whatever's going to be, you know, that berserker energy, intimidate and take no prisoners thing, that's, and that, that, that's a different experience too, and it's, it's something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say at the time, which would, the hardcore that drew from specifically, I'd say Slayer, even Sepultura and all that, Pantera would be Hate Free, became a huge band. They were... Very like, anthem Yeah. Like, in the beginning, it was just, it was heavy. But that goes right back to what you were saying, because I, I remember Hate Breed, like, when they first started picking up Steam, because my uncles were all into them and shit. Yeah, because um, he was, yeah, Jamie was, got on MTV. Yes. Like, it was, we were blown away. It was the first thing But was, there, were, there was, like, Uranium and Headbangers Ball back in the day. Yeah, I remember I had ran over with Ricky Rackman was the, yeah. the main guy. I watched that in uh, 120 Minutes. Like, those were the cool shows. Like, Headbangers Ball, 120 Minutes, Alternative Nation, that was kind of alright. That was, like, the more watered-down one. But, yeah, when we heard uh, Jamie was the host of that, it, it was kind of amazing he became the host of this legendary show but it also showed that like hatebreed went from this really obscure band from connecticut like super tough heavy band to like they're like the real deal now i think they're a perfect example of the formula you were describing um like the being catchy but also being part of the scene and also questionably 
Yeah. Well, interestingly Because they, they have very, like, what I... I don't know if that's the right word, but, like, anthem... Anthemic oh, type un, of songs. Oh, unfortunately, like, their early... Like, one of their big ones I will be was, heard. Uh, that was... That was, like, kind of the breakthrough song, I think. But originally... Um, Oh, okay, like, Not One Truth was, like, the big... Like, they had, like, these moments where it was a big sing-along. Yeah. All their songs, I think, are filth. Like, they just have... You know, the mosh bars were super heavy, so it get people breaking each other's heads off. Defeated. They, they had... Yeah, it, it's all the sing-along stuff. They always had that from the beginning. And a lot of those bands, including a lot of the Long Island hardcore bands, they come to Long Island a lot for shows from Connecticut. Um... A lot of drew influence from hip hop too, and that made sense because like a lot of the New York bands, the scenes, especially in the '80s, they were very. You just blew my mind a little bit because that actually fucking hate breed actually sounds a lot like uh, Body Count. In well, a way. Body Count was uh, Ice T's hardcore band. Yep. And um, I think of like, oh, classic like uh, Blood, Sweat, No Tears, Sick of It All. It starts out with Karis One yep. in- introducing Sick of It All. But that was very, like, New York. I'd never even heard about that. Well, That's crazy. So the whole New York scene, you have hip-hop, pretty much was in the Bronx, like, if I remember or understand correctly the history, that's, like, where it built up. Similar kind of feel, like, New York was just a war zone in the 70s and yeah. the 80s. I remember the, because I'm old enough to remember the 80s as a kid going and visiting my uncle, and, like, all the stuff was just covered in graffiti. It was very exciting, but it was... But dangerous it was as hell. Everyone was intense. Um, yeah, and then you had the Lower East Side crew we were talking about. That's, you know, Agnostic Front. Yeah. And they were bringing the whole skinhead movement to, and not, not like the people think skinheads, like Nazi stuff. They, the English version of this. Yeah. Well, even the English one had, it, the, the initial one was the whole, it was multi- working class. culture, working class. The reason their heads were shaved was because they worked in factories and they wanted their hair tugged, Doc Martin steel toes, so your feet don't get smashed. Right. The clothes and the look was on the weekend. You're gonna go out with the little money you have and like look your best. Very, it's, it's awesome. You know, um, there the influence is all from a lot from Caribbean soul and 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 ska and all that. Anyway, it grows into the punk thing, and then in the '80s, the whole nationalist movement. Find again, you find young men who are really aggressive, disaffecting, aggressive. That's gonna be your fo- shoulders for any um, authoritarian movement, whether it's nationalist white power or, or even like super left-wing uh antifa kind of stuff yep. it's it's all going to be in there um but yeah agnostic front they were kind of like the i think they'd are they were like the first american skin at like taking that mentality um and and also the aesthetic they were fast they were punk and their fucking logo was a pair of doc martin yeah, exactly and um and even like the later 88 wave like judge drew a lot of influence from that oi sound i got a lot i got very into roger Merritt specifically when i was uh skateboarding yep you know because i dude i would like skate with fucking doc martens on when i was a kid you know <laughs> I remember. they were all fucking I kick flipped well, out well, on the well, side we made those mistakes like broke our ankles doing yeah stuff like that. <laughs> but i was like i was one of those kids where i was just like fucking i wanted i didn't i embraced being different you know yeah, what that's i mean awesome. like that's people were like you're out of your fucking mind for that and i'm like yeah cool you're not Good. the first to do it, and, yeah. and all the people did were just because you, yeah, the Doc Martens meant something. If that's that's one of those orthodoxies have with so this test of time because it comes from something so deep, yeah, has a deep history beneath it. And the thing I loved about Agnostic Front was that is the the like aesthetic of it because Roger Merritt back in the day, dude, he looked like a fucking inmate. He oh, looked yeah. like he just got out. Those, you know what I mean? And he was a fucking guys. intimidating dude. Yeah, they were part of. Those are DMS guys. I believe, yeah, DMS. and like Madball came out, so his uh, younger brother Freddie. Then you got Crow Mags with fucking with, uh, John Joseph and Harley, and then another. Like, Harley's like, awesome. He's actually a black belt. Through, yeah, you just through Henzo. Yep. Yeah. Oh, he's. I didn't know he did Henzo. He trains at okay. the Blue Basement. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, remember, I. Um. Yeah, there was that whole kind of thing, but yeah, Crow Crow Mags, he's a Crow's top ten. All time hardcore. I would say punk records of all time. Yeah. But that was very New York. Yeah. Chrome Mags, Agnostic Front, um, Bad Brains originally from DC. But Bad Brains is awesome too. But see, these are all bands that, like, they don't have, they, on the outside, like, if you bumped into one of these guys on the street back then, you'd be like, what the fuck? I gotta get out of here, right? Like, you'd be intimidated. 
But if you listen to their music, if you listen to the words, which we keep oh, on coming back to, crazy. it's all positive, dude. And it's like, especially when you go to someone, uh, a band like uh, Bad Brains, because yeah. it's like fucking like PMA. Their whole thing is yeah. like po- yeah, positive ran, mental attitude. They got attitude. that book and got really, and, and they're a particular HR is very unique. That guy, he, everything I've seen on him, he, he seems like such a sweetheart. He's, like, he's he, a ball of energy. Yeah, he is. But oh. he seems like he just cares about people. Yeah, I mean, the, the guy, he's just unique. Yeah. <laughs> and very intense and, uh, like, into excitement and, and very exciting. But, yeah, musically, yeah, Bad Brain. I mean, I, that first was the uh, self-titled record. I actually like Rock for Light, which is basically those tracks as well. But that, that shit's Band in DC. Time. Oh, yeah. But... Yeah, that was very... But that speaks to New York, right? You have those guys coming up from D.C. And they arguably gave birth to hardcore. Yeah. Um, they, you know, even prior to Meyer, like, they were the band. And nothing beat them. Like, they're... And they still play live, I think. So I, I was fortunate enough to catch them further back in the 90s. And it was just unlike anything else. It, but... Yeah, that spoke to, like, the uniqueness and the power of New York. They were all living in a really tough neighborhood in the Lower East Side. And, um, yeah, and Notch Brown had the skinhead thing going. Crow Mags brought, like, that, like, thrash sound. Super tough. They had the Krish- that He gave birth to the little Krishna core scene. Uh, so Hari Krishna was mixed into That's it. That's insane. Uh, that <laughs> I've never a, even that heard of that. That was a product of some guy who was wandering around Tompkins Square Park. He, I think they all worked at some kind of, like, health food store and... Um, this is and it's wild. a really cool story. Very interesting, and like a whole bunch of stuff came out of that. Um, bands like 108 and Shelter, and um, even Zach De La Rogue, he was in a band, uh, Inside Out, before Rage Against the Machine, which was a Krishna core band. It's fucking crazy. Um, but I, I'm going tangent, but yeah, I'm thinking of New York. Where was I even getting to New York from that? They had that like kind of intense scene, sort of agnostic front. I don't know. Anyway. 80s, being dangerous, going to your uncles, yeah. visiting. Yeah, it was rough town but what was beneath all that is it, it's something that just can't be shaken it, it harkens and i i do you know point to the birth of it is definitely the uk like um you know this whole skinhead movement there the oi movement initially like you know the 77 punk rock that those were like the signals that the you know different areas in the u.s like New York, D.C., L.A., take from them, they make their own thing. And I think that speaks to something very exciting and special about the U.S. and America in general, we'll include Canada in there, is because of, for lack of a better term, the social diversity in our country, yeah. different cultures. and like You get in, different in, regions giving in you different in the, sounds. And the spirit of individuality. I, I can't, you know, overstate that enough. That, that there is, and I, I think it's, partially being resurrected as an idea in our culture. People are starting to re-embrace again freedom of speech and freedom and freedom. You know, it has kind of like a cliche, silly part of it, but there is a deeper part of it too. Yep. Um, I do think we are very fortunate to be in a country that still to this day has baked into its, uh, its legal system the ability to express yourself however you want, as long as it, you know, um, well, no, I guess it's more as long as your actions don't infringe upon someone else's right. liberties. And I, I think that did have a lot to do with how American hardcore became its own thing, which, again, gave birth to bands like the Beastie Boys. Right. They're Beastie Boys because they worship bad brains. That's where the BB comes from. They were you know, being recorded by the same guy. And most people now, if they don't know the history, would say, what the hell does it have anything to do with this band? you know, singing a song like Attitude, yelling, and this guy's doing flips, and this band's doing kind of like New York hip-hop. But it's, it's Side note thing. on the Beastie Boys, do you know who did the solo on Fight for Your Right? Um, I don't, but my guess is some kind of like metalhead dude. or Kerry King. Okay, there you go. Well, that speaks to... They were both working with Rick Rubin at the time. Okay, yeah, and, and Kerry King, I think you'll see pictures of him with Dead Kennedy shirts on. Oh, yeah. They were all... All that stuff was... That's the difference... Thrash and that metal is tied to punk, whereas like traditional heavy metal, Dio and um, I don't know what else would be traditional I heavy fucking metal. Fucking love Jesus Dio. Priest, that that's almost what would that be tied to? 
I guess, r- traditional rock and roll and, and um, almost like classical. British Invasion. Yeah, yeah, probably the mod stuff and the garage rock stuff down there. Because I think a band like Iron Maiden, that had more of the punk feel to it. I love Maiden. And you can hear it in the sound. How about Budgie? Um, oh, my God, Budgie. That's never heard in a million years. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, that's all the stuff Metallica was into. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. Yeah, but it's interesting seeing, like, Metallica came from punk. That's what they're Yeah, for it's sure. Really where you How many start. times have you seen a picture of James and fucking Lars well, and Kirk garages. all wearing Misfits shirts? Yeah, exactly. Garages, they cover... Um, Last, Last Caress and Green Hell. Yep, Green Hell, and they cover, I think, a Discharge song. They covered a Holocaust song, um, Small Hours. Yeah. I'm trying to... Then this shows how long ago I listened down, to down, 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 I'll have to li- I have that on tape. It's a Probably badass somewhere. song, dude. Yeah, and then, I mean, he, I think he still wears his, like, Discharge patch and all that, but that, yeah. whereas I think traditional heavy metal, like, they were just metal from the start, or something, you know, they were coming more from a theatric background, it was less about the culture, um, more about the aesthetic, I could be wrong, but that, that's at least what goes through my head, and you can track it when you listen to different... They were like, if you mix bands. Budgie, Diamond Head, and, uh, uh Venom together and just made gumbo out of it that's metallica's early days yeah i think like venom definitely that's punk like it's even how they presented themselves yeah um yeah it's i don't know it's just interesting seeing how this stuff all comes together and and if if all those different influences weren't being mixed together you would and this is coming back to my point with with like load and stuff like that like if you didn't have an open mind going into it, right? If I didn't, if I just closed my mind to bands like Collective Soul or Alice in Chains or Alanis Morissette, not that any of them have anything to do with each other, but if I closed my mind to those bands just because I only listen to thrash. You deprive yourself of all this awesome shit. Yeah, dude. And my music would suck. You know, yeah. like the stuff that I'm writing would only sound like old Metallica. Not that that sucks, but it's... me doing it again would be boring. We've yeah. all heard it. You but know? I'm thinking this is interesting because through a cultural lens, a tribal lens, there's a time to close your mind for preservation of the culture, but you got to be careful because it will get too stagnant if you close it too much and you'll lose access to all these things. So I'm thinking of an instance where traditionally it made sense to close one's mind to something like Collective Soul, or even Alice in Chains, I remember. Like, I'm yeah. in the 90s, so... Metal guys weren't going to listen to grunge. Well, they were, though, initially. Take a band like Soundgarden. Or well, even, you, bro, or, how do you not listen to Soundgarden? Well, I'll tell you how, eventually. Where people who were coming from, who were connecting to music through culture, like we had skating, and that was very important. And there was this, like, a way there was like an ethos that made that exciting and, and a home for people, whatever you want to call it. And a big part of it was accessing genuinely underground music and not only bands that that remained committed to underground music. And I think that's why Nirvana remained in the good graces because Kurt Cobain from my reading, really did stick. Like, he was doing what he was doing no matter what. And yeah. That, that was very meaningful. Soundgarden, Smashing Pumpkins, even Alice in Chains, for that matter, all were initially very, like, Facelift was, like, underground. Smashing Pumpkins, Gish was underground. Uh, Soundgarden's early stuff was underground. But eventually, MTV got a hold of it, and it became poppy. And they kind of... But is that through their doing? No. Well, it, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's uh, like I say in the case of what I observe with Smashing Pumpkins, I think Billy Corgan wanted to walk the path of Hollywood. And I, I'd even say Soundgarden did too, and I think it was even appropriate because it, it, their whole... They weren't a band that grew out of punk the right. way that Nirvana did. I mean, Dave Grohl literally was... Uh, I think he was drumming for DC hardcore bands initially. Um, Kirk Cobain just was his own person. He was just doing what he's doing. Yeah. Um, Alice and Chains were part of like the underground metal scene. I think once their sound really matured, and I'd say gave birth to what eventually became a lot of cheesy sounds, vocally speaking, like a lot of 
guitar guy like a band was a Creed or Nickel, one of those bands. Like they started singing that way probably because of Alice in Chains and maybe even Pearl Jam for that matter. Yeah. So at that time, the cultures that were forming, if you could even call them a culture, around bands like Alice in Chains or Soundgarden, were the people who were formerly not into music at all because they just wanted to do whatever was mainstream and would make fun of all the people who were skating and all that. So then at that point, the culture felt like, well, we had, fuck that shit. Like, we can't touch Soundgarden anymore. We can't touch Smashing Pumpkins. All that stuff's mainstream. is sold out. Back to the tribal like, aspect yeah, of it, it. Now it's time to get DIY. It's time to get underground. And it, it were, and, and that's actually what I think gave birth that reinvigorated hardcore again. Like, hardcore is a musical and cultural style, at least on Long Island, New York. Because everyone was looking for that next, like, more intense, real thing. And, and it, you were coming right off of hair metal, which was super fucking well, mainstream. That, that's what, and, and, and actually that was the uh, death of a lot of 80s hardcore bands. So a lot of them started becoming bigger and bigger, and then they just turned into these goofy things that lost touch to the um, integrity of that. Now, a band like Fugazi, like I was saying earlier, did both. They remain, I mean, I would argue Ian McKay is, has proven <laughs> the, the, uh, commitment to DIY and I are played one of the most critical roles in DIY punk and hardcore. And because they stubbornly, like Fugazi's deal was, we will not play a show unless it's all ages and five dollars. I don't care how much you pay us. That's awesome. I think Sony tried buying Discord Records, the label which was owned by Ian McKay and, and uh, oh god, the other dude from Minor Threat, just so they could get a hold of Fugazi, they refused. Uh, I think it's probably Ian himself refused. It was always on their terms. Um, the records were all five dollars, but they were like particularly that song "Waiting Room." That was like the hit everyone was about, and and like they remain underground while having the reach of a mainstream like grunge band. Yeah, and um, the the crazy thing is, it sounds because I don't really I, I I'm not very well versed in their stuff. I've heard of them, yeah. um, but at you at the like, end of the day. Here, I'm definitely going to listen to him after this, but, uh, like, literally right after this. I'll be eating my lunch to that shit. But, um, it kind of sounds like, um, because I actually have heard of Ian McKay. I don't know where, but, like, my He's probably out. my brother. My brother would be like, dude. Yeah, I know him from Minor Threat. Bro. That was and I know Minor Threat. Um, was before, like my, minor I threat. literally re- grew up with my brother wearing their shirts, so nice. I do know of him. Um, but it sounds to me like he didn't do this on purpose necessarily, but it was just like it's, it was, he stuck to his guns. It, I don't think he had any choice. So actually, this will speak to the name Martyrs. I'll do a quick tangent. Why I did something I never thought I'd do is name a band after a horror movie. Mm-hmm. So I, you should check out the movie if you're into horror, or even if you're not. It's oh, I will. Film. But... What I took from the name martyrs, that then they, they kind of give the definition, the original definition in Greek. I think a martyr, most people think it's like a religious zealot who will die for a cause. Yep. I think the direct translation is witness. And what I gathered from it is the martyr in that sense is someone who has witnessed a truth that's so undeniable that even if they wanted to deviate, they can't. So like a Socrates, like... He, he had to die because he couldn't admit an untruth or a falsity. Like, it, that, that, so, most people think of Mara as, like, someone who will martyr themselves. It's, it, you're saying it's not being it's just you, willing to die. It's just it, being it, so convinced like meaning of Meaning that, like, you may end up dead because you're faced with a, cho- with a choice you can't make because it will violate your core integrity. Not even have stubbornness. Like, you're just at this. I don't know if singularity is the right word, but this this, this uh, inflection point where even if you said what other people wanted to hear, you say they, they couldn't believe you because they know like that person would never believe it. It's just in their nature. So yeah. like Ian McKay is, from my eyes, just pure individual. You watch an interview with him at 18, 19 years old, and now it's the same shit, right. same person. It's awesome. So That sounds like my dad. <laughs> that, that's not surprising. And that's awesome. And that that's to no surprise, you know, that you and, and your brother, for that matter, are the way you are. You, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it, it's in the, the vibe. It's just in there. And that's, yeah, that's the shit. That's, that, to me, is what martyr in that sense is, is you just, there's just some kind of, 
thing you embrace that, that is as true as true to you, and you can't deviate from that. And, um, yeah, that's where the cool shit's at. It's, you know, I don't know what people call it, individuality, being genuine, keeping it real. Like, that's that's what that is, and that's what Ian McKay is, and that's what God is. And, the, again, that's where the, what I was talking about, the, the gatekeeping. Once the culture, counterculture, subculture, or we'll just call it hardcore, is functioning properly to me, when they're closing the gates appropriately. So you take a band like Slipknot. There was a point when that band initially became a thing where the idea was, oh, well, they're heavy too, so therefore that belongs here. So people who, and at that time, it was like, no, 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 that's, that's kind of like theatrical Hollywood. It, it's not the same thing. We don't it's want... Esque. Yeah, and again... Now, now that it's found its appropriate footing, in my opinion, it's it's fine. But like at the time when they were becoming a known band, the hardcore scene was genuinely underground. Yeah. And it could only maintain that integrity by being that way. And it wasn't, you know. So when the gate is not closed through snobbery, but through preservation, because you're aware, you know, because if certain, I guess the thing they were concerned about getting in there, which I was too, is. In true hardcore, big label, anything that will cater, literally present itself to gain more market share, it, it can't, no can't no. be here. And that is there now. It is, like, in terms of what people will mostly call hardcore in the scene, it is there. And um, that's actually, a, it speaks to another decision. I, I, I've never been on social media, like, part of it. And that was a decision with Martyrs, is not, we have the music out there. Like, initially, I just wanted the music, the full records were on YouTube. I'm so glad you're touching on this right now. I have another question after you. Okay, I'll go quick. But like, no, 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 take no, your time. No Facebook, nothing. And I stubbornly sent it, which is, which is to our detriment in terms of trying to get shows and stuff. But my belief is social media has destroyed genuine underground culture, particularly hardcore culture, and I'd say art, music, everything culture. And not in a conspiratorial way, I just think the nature of it allows too much connection. There's too many inroads, so like there's no, no one even knows what gates proper to close or opening, and people think they're gatekeepers and they're not. It, it just, the underground got uprooted and it's lost its Luster. So now I think the only way anything like that can happen is if people you force it op- to be that well, way. Well, you just have to op- make a choice to operate outside of it. And if people find you, and this is that basically what Minor Threat was like, they only played for their friends. They never thought they were going to get big. They so doing, it's word of mouth. That's it. That's it. I only so uh, for my band, I only want to play live shows. I don't want people to learn anything about us through online, I want them to experience this live. I, I think it's reasonable to have our music there so people can hear how we sound. So I think it's on Spotify. You just answered my question. So okay. I was going to say, how can people find it? Um, so I think the best one is the band camp. The reason I was, I, I even was stubbornly trying to resist that, but then I thought, well, it's just sharing music. That's reasonable. So it's uh, martyrsboston.bandcamp.com or all our records on there. And it's mainly to sell our, the second record we put out, The Great Disturbance, I pressed on 12-inch vinyl, and um, people wanted a way to buy it online. I'm like, oh, well, you could do it through Bandcamp. That's reasonable. Okay. Um, but, yeah, the idea is <clears throat> I only want to connect to people live, ideally. I want, if they want to know anything, come up and talk to us. I like That's the idea awesome. live music, and particularly hardcore, is removing that line of demarcation between the stage, the band on stage, and the crowd. When it's functioning properly, everyone is mixed. Sometimes the crowd is singing the lyrics louder than the band itself, and that's when it's really functioning properly. That, to me, is what always attracted me. Particularly the, when I say hardcore, not necessarily the sound, but the scene, and that would be like the most extreme underground of punk. American punk is hardcore. And that's where you're going to find... Everything from Evo to Bad Brains to... Uh, ironically, Jimmy Eat World became like a big pop band, but they were originally an emo core band. I think they just put out an album. I'm um, sure they did. I mean, but like that, that was an example of a band that became, you know, they were just so pop sensible that they became a mainstream band, but that came from the underground hardcore scene to, um, oh my God, it's just like the, the, 
the spectrum of the sound from my experience, especially in the live setting, is so vast. Um, uh, Converge, for instance, a lot of people consider them extreme mode, and they're a hardcore band. Um, like you were talking about the metal scene in Matthew, like Worcester had a lot of that. That was in my the palladium and the play more like metallic hardcore band, but at the core. I saw made, Overcast over there. Overcast, yep, that was a classic. That was a badass metalcore metallic I think I was hardcore like 14 band. Fourteen when I. Awesome. Yep, and and again, those bands were committed to the hardcore scene before they were like metal was their expression. No more than uh, Piebald was a, an emo core band, but yep. they're in that band Caven I showed you. They're um, badass, dude. Awesome. So like, Steve, like, he was more metal influenced. If you listen to like his other stuff, it's, especially their other stuff, it's it's like heavy, like screaming metal hardcore. Dude, I love how. Um, I'm a big fan of Carl Jung, um, but I, I, I speak of his, uh, I guess, theory of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Um, you had no idea I listened to Failure. Um, you showed me that band and I immediately thought of Fantastic Planet. Yep, and then it turned and out I fucking, Rod T was obsessed with it, and that was his And thing. I literally went through, like, I'm still going through it, but I, like, went through a time where I was obsessed with that album because of Tool. Um, because yep. I heard that they were buddies with um, Tool. Yeah, and I told you that. I saw them open for them. And, and that makes sense. Cause and he, all of that stuff He probably made up. a decision, like, we're bringing this band on tour because they're awesome. I saw it. It was one of the few bands I saw live, especially at that point in history, because a lot of bands actually sounded shitty live then. Well, yeah. One particular one was disappointing with Smashing Pumpkins. Like, I love the first two, particularly Siamese Dream. That's actually a big influence in a lot of my current bands' writing. Seeing them live was so underwhelming because they did such magic in the studio. They just couldn't replicate it live. That's awesome. And a lot of bands then were like that. They just yeah. weren't good. Failure, I heard, like, I heard every hook. I was like, holy shit. And I immediately started hunting You're for like, they Mac. figured something out here. Yeah, it was awesome. And I remember the particular songs. I think one was like, Frogs was like the song that was hitting me. And was that I, off the... Magnified. Magnified, yeah. yeah. That was the only With record. the frog on the cover? Yep. And I hunted everywhere. That was not easy to find. Especially then, like all those. I were, love that that's on YouTube now. Awesome. <laughs> you can exactly. find it like this. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, you can get anything on there. But, um... How it, oh yeah, but that that's how that band resonated with me. Um, but yeah, we're talking the Carl Jung synchronicity thing. Yeah, I think it was fucking hilarious that like all of that shit got wrapped up, and then you're like, yeah, I, I went to uh, the you you saw the Undertow tour, and you saw Failure with Tool. Yep, yep, they opened for Tool. And I'm like, bro, oh, like, man. what a damn show! That had to be dope. It was excellent. Yeah, yeah, and even it's interesting, Tool. So. At that time, they were a very respected band in the underground because they were there was nothing like that. Right. Them. So there's certain bands that. So Tool, I would say, always remained, oh, unquestionably, like tethered to their ethos. Like he, but be, the market, for lack of a better term, was particularly when Enema came out. That's when they started really playing big arena. I saw them at Fitchburg or something. That's awesome. And. With the Melvins. Um, Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> Come on. Oh, my God. I remember. So, yeah, so the, the girl I was dating at the time was getting, like, a costume. It was one of the few times I actually, uh, like, arbitrarily hit someone. Because I'm not a particularly violent person. But she was not even five feet and was getting just completely a costume as guy. So, um, I knocked him down. So. <laughs> but uh, that's one of the few things I remember that show. Oh, and he was painted blue when he was on stage. Maynard. But anyway, oh yeah, so this, uh, that actually speaks to the Acosta, the person I'm describing. At that point, the kind of like mainstream, like, I hate using the term, like a bro dude crowd at the time, got into Tool because it was like, oh, that shit's fucking badass, bro. And the whole culture around you're, the you're, band. Your football player that listens to Pantera? Yeah, now, there's something to think about a lot, because like, football player then... Not all football, but, but like that kind of archetype, using a Jungian term, earned its reputation of like a... No, no. I mean, it depends what point in time. But yeah. at that point, oh, it was like 1996 or seven, something like that. 
when that crowd got in there, same with Jane's Addiction for that matter, it just soured. Like, um, it's I'm not, so crazy that jocks were into Jane's didn't, Addiction. Didn't adapt because Jane's at, at the original that was the underground. Like, if you were into alternative or that early '90s shit, it, that was the band. Because they actually broke up when all that stuff started happening. The right. grunge, Nirvana, alternative. But like, yeah, they uh, were doing shit in the 80s. Unique, oh, yeah. I mean, he started a band, Psycom was Perry Frill's resume. It was like, basically like Bauhaus. And I'm a big Bauhaus fan. Um, and just, cre- that, that was very I actually West just, Coast. like, I'm sorry to cut you yeah. off. I just want to say, I literally, like, two weeks ago, fucking watched a documentary on Jane's Addiction. And they are a fascinating oh. band. Nothing like it. Nothing like that. Perry Farrell is, like, one of those d- dudes that, like... It's like Maynard. Like, just has a fucking way about him where everything he touches is unique. Yeah. No, that's 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 a special person. And at that point in time, no one would argue that Jane Addiction was something else. Yeah. Because, again, they were very pop-sensible. They, they appealed to that music brain we were talking about earlier. I think it was probably Jane Says, or one of those songs. And that was a song. It got on the radio. Got and then caught when, stealing, or whatever. Then caught stealing was going bad. It was pretty Jane Says, when they reformed that same crowd that came to the Tool concert. And there were two problems. One, oh, no, Jane would play, like, big Madison Square Garden shows back then. But, again, that's when it was all underground. So those arenas were packed 110% with fanatics and zealots. Right. Now... When Jane's Addiction reformed or Tool is playing the Animator, the Zealots kind of like well, two things. Happened. One, I think the genuine underground had shifted back to hardcore because that that was really where the shit was at. And interestingly enough, between hardcore and that, at least in New York, industrial was the genuine underground scene. The Which end of industrial like biohazard and industrial was more like um, I mean the more main or sh- mainstream nails. would be like Ministry Nine Inch Nails like deeper and skinny puppy leather skinny strip. puppy yeah that's a good one um, you know the eighty stuff came at the end people like people don't realize Ministry was actually like originally the fucking like basically they were goth, emo pop, goth yeah yeah that, now that stuff back then the earlier goth post punk stuff. The Marlin is like, oh, we want Ministry the heavy band. Yeah. Like doing thieves, but <clears throat> further Jesus back. Built my hot rod. Exactly. Cause that <laughs> stuff was exciting then. Like the heavier the better. But you go further back to the 80s, like that those <clears throat> um, post punk goth even they were no joke. That stuff was edgy. I, I'm actually even thinking like new wave bands uh, in the UK, um, like Duran Duran or whatever. Uh, a the lot. Cult. Of, Oh, color state. But I think pretty like Duran Duran is like very like glammy and flamboyant. And bright. A lot of people thought and also think that they were like some sissy boys. These were all like tough working class Brits. Right. Who would show up in bars looking that way and of course people pick up. They'll allow you to they, think that they way would about them. Fuck them up. Yeah. So again, that's what was so cool about that whole new wave scene, which grew out of punk. Like new wave was the new wave of punk, and then that broke off in the post punk, like Joy Division and. That's kind of touching to the goth stuff, which you get back to the early ministry stuff. So it's all part of the same thing. So that was appropriate. Like, twitching with sympathy ministry was was right for that time. Even earlier, Skinny Puppy kind of harkens back to that sound. Which they fucking, they were a big influence on Tool. Yep, that makes sense. And Tool was actually considered an industrial band initially. Which is fucking crazy. That's just because they couldn't fit into anything. Well, and... Well, this is another chance. So, industrial became very synth-dominated because that was a hallmark sign. That was, like, the instrument. And even purists would only do... Which I was for a while. I would only listen to, like, pure synth, even though Skinny Puppy would use guitars. Like, But originally, industrial was just, like, beating on metal. Like, Einstürste Neubauten from Germany. Uh, um, I think Die Kreutz. Like, the earliest stuff was... Literally, like, industries, like, clanging on things. Be like, Kraftwerk? Is that... Kraftwerk, was, which was pure synth, but they, they were, they were, I mean, I guess they were considered, uh, not kraut rock, but, uh, synth pop kind of, whatever, there's all these terms, but it's the same kind of, the Hallmark Sun, um, the founding, yeah, the, the, the feel of industrial, i say especially in the 90s, it was like the fusion between crust punk and synth pop. Is very dark, very intense, very heavy feeling. Um, Did we get into Swans? I love Swans. I saw their, I don't know, they, they play something, but uh, 
I lived in Davis Square area for because I went to school in that area. At the Somerville Theater, I don't know if you've ever been in Davis Square. And I lived in Somerville. Oh, okay, so I saw Swan. Went to hell. This gets even more interesting. I saw Swan's last show at the Somerville Theater, their last show at the time, which Swan's was one of the loudest bands of all time, too. Yeah. They were on the Awesome. I was introduced to Choke from Slapshot there because one of my friend's older sisters knew him. And that's when I realized, oh, Choke's into all this industrial stuff, which in retrospect makes sense because Slapshot did like an industrial influence record, which speaks to there was a point in history where industrial was the most underground shit. Going back to Ministry and Ian McKay. That's so crazy. Ministry did a, collab- Ian McKay did a collaboration with Alec Jorgensen from Ministry called Palehead, which is an awesome EP. So... That, uh, that it's fucked up how all this shit collides together. All, all punk. It's all punk. And hardcore is the American punk. Like, hardcore just means it's, like, the truest, hard, most hardcore underground. Like, it's in the word. It's, like, what's the most, like, individual... Like, and you have to be individual to be the most underground. In like, DIY. Further away from the mainstream. And when it's working right, it's not because you're walking away from the mainstream. You're just doing your thing. It just doesn't... It does not fit there. Yeah. So, um... How is it going? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Industrial was, like... That was where the shit was at. I'd say probably around 1992, because the Lollapalooza tours started really making stuff mainstream. MTV was starting to play. Um, I would say the singles, Jeremy from from Pearl Jam, Today from Smashing Pumpkins. Obviously, Nirvana had their singles since since Nevermind came with with uh, Smells Like Scene Spirit, but I, I would say that's less so. Um, Black Hole Sun Soundgarden. Those singles took all those bands and made them mainstream, and that's where the line of demarcation was made. And people were still trying to find like the most underground bands. Like, right. Okay. Jane Addiction was really at the root. If you were gonna find the most underground alternative band, Jane Addiction was it. It's that very West Coast bohemian, drawing from punk, but also drawing from. Uh, there's just something about the West Coast, the beaches, the like that San Francisco juxtaposition of like flowers and cults, <laughs> and particularly in LA, it's like beaches and people getting stabbed and uh, all the drugs you can eat. Exactly. <laughs> and then you have bands like X and I don't know that, that that where am I going with that? Okay, so Jane Addiction was that, but then really beneath it, I say particularly in New York, it was the industrial scene. There were two, three clubs of note. One was the Bank on Houston, Lower East Side. Back cave, and then Limelight was like the club. It was an old church converted into a club, which is an amazing spot. That's cool. Crazy history there. But that was where the shit was at until I would say around <clears throat> 94, when at least in New York, hardcore started becoming a real scene. And particularly in my town, I lived in Huntington, which had a club, Roseland, where a lot of the hardcore shows went. And that's where Hapri would come to play and all that. Um, and then that, at that point, that was where the shit was at. And I think. In the heavy space, like people looking for the heaviest band, that's where it was at. So it was like, oh, you think Slayer and Pantera are tough and heavy? You Watch know, this shit. Hold see my beer. See Hate Breed play. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, then I moved up to Boston in 95, and still there were hardcore bands playing shows, like more modern ones, like 10 Yard Fight and all, but it wasn't a big thing, at least in my experience. Then it was more. Like this, the music punk rock. There's a club, the Rat, in Boston, where they'd have punk rock Olympics and it'd be bands like the Queers and the Pits. Punk Pitt rock and Olympics. That. It was they were that's actually fucking awesome. awesome. Like that's where the scene was, the underground scene. And Green Day actually they were initially a very underground band. That was kind of like the pop punk. That era was resonating, and then '96. I think a bunch of kids from. Connecticut. They ran a label, Bridge Nine Records, moved up, and with them came all the youth career revival bands. That's where the underground began. And I think that was some of the best underground music that I've been aware of. An underground scene was particularly in Boston, 96 on to like early 2000s. All hardcore. That's like where the shit was at. Um, what a time to be around, dude. It was fucking awesome. <laughs> that, like, and again, that gave birth. This bands are massive. They everywhere from Converge, Caven was part of that scene. Uh, like that band Pyro. So everything from like true emo core. Not like now emo is a weird name, but like that. I guess technically it was uh, the name was forged in DC by uh, I think Brian Baker, who was in Dagnasia at the time. 
uh, made the turn, but like the way as a music style, I'd say emo core grew out of the more indie rock pop punk sounding stuff from the 90s. So I say one of the early bands like Sunny Day Real Estate. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Never heard of them. So that sound kind of influenced a lot of the emo core 90s era stuff. Get Up Kids, Piebald, Promise Ring and all that. It was very like... They were creative with these names, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was like, but those bands who were part of the hardcore scene were ve- people call them very like soft and like they sing melodically, songs about, like, getting broken up with. Actually, uh, you probably know, the, uh, have you heard of uh, Taking Back Sunday? Yeah. So that was that was a Long Island hardcore emo core band. That was all part of the same scene that Hatebreed was part of. Wow. And Convert, which is, like, chaotic, neurosis-inspired metal. And um, uh, Biohazard, like you say, which is further back, like, which is hip-hop-inspired metal hardcore yeah like urban and kind of like you're mad ball very new york <laughs> yep that's all part of the same thing and then um youth crew uh revival was more like gorilla biscuits youth it today so it's fast it's it's uh, you listen to seven seconds at all i don't think so your, your brother may listen to it. that's very like you know the beats are always like like yep. very fast and like sing along and very goes punk. and yeah very punk driven hardcore it's all part of the same thing this is why i say you can't be closed fucking minded you have to listen to everything yeah. because it all starts from somewhere and the fucked up thing is yeah. all those dudes like led zeppelin oh yeah i don't care who it is you and, know what i mean well, and interestingly enough i'm thinking of this scene so there gets so it does start that way so you have someone like rossi from cave who from my observation to this day has been extremely genuine like has deep integrity he's just very talented creatively as a player there's just something going on that's just giving birth something amazing and yes yeah, so he got into the beach boys and all right maybe he always was but apparently he was singing one of his records on his back because one of the dudes from the beach boys did it and then he got into failure for that record wow you know, so they they went more the prog route, which was interesting to observe because most people knew Cave and was like, oh, they're that, that like really heavy metallic hardcore band that yells, and now it's like they're doing proggy stuff. Um, so it's one of the reasons I like Death so much. Uh, oh, the band Death. Yeah, not no. not, a <laughs> not band called Death. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, okay, because there's two Deaths, right? There's like uh, that documentary of band called, and there's the Death, like the metal. Yeah, but Chuck Schuldner, like he. At you know, it it cost him some of his fans. It cost him you know the sometimes his reputation, sometimes you know. But people are fucking gatekeepy, and that's just yeah. how it goes in music. Um, but like a lot of people, I've heard I've heard a lot of people talk like somewhat negatively about um, Sound of Perseverance, and it's such a fucking amazing album. It's like yeah. more he put more Judas Priest influence into it and stuff, but it's like. Why hate on something because he's putting his influences into it? Why, why, it's, every fucking Death album sounds different than the last one, and I see nothing wrong with that. No, it's great. And then a lot of this it's stuff gross. is, a lot of this stuff is appreciated in retrospect. It's yeah. like the saying, Steamboat comes at Steamboat time. I think that speaks to, like, the person who created the original Steam Engine and created it too early, and it wasn't embraced, but obviously when it worked, it was great. Same with music. So probably, I, I'm not a big Death fan, but I'm familiar with them and the whole scene. My guess is when he was pushing the limits, the scene was in preservation mode because it was very underground. And it's like, eh, don't bring that mainstream or weird shit in here. Yep. So it's going to contaminate. We have a good thing going. It's going to contaminate. I mean, he covered Painkiller on his last album. Oh, the uh, Judas Priest. Priest song. This is the yeah. Movie. And he fucking murders it, dude. If you, if you want to hear a good cover, check that I, I shit would, out. I would imagine so. Um, it's so different though, like, cause you, his, his growling vocals, you don't realize this guy can sing almost yeah. well, spot and, and on. And the band maintained his entire, it's, just, it's a name that no one is going to fuck with. Right. And so that speaks again to like Brodsky from Cave. When people are rooted, regardless of the resistance they're getting, they can pull in whatever. Cause they, they're just anchored in the culture. Cause they're, they're a pillar of the culture. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's. And again, that speaks to why hardcore as a functional music scene, it's it's vast in its musical influence. 
and, and I would argue pulling stuff from everywhere. Well, and it, it, I would argue it is probably the key driving force behind mainstream culture now. The reason most people have sleeve tattoos as in Maine is because of the harks. I will argue that. Um, the foodie scene, uh, like I, I think a big driver in this too was Vice magazine, which started as just like a magazine underground thing, and then used to be good. Can't stand it now, but right. it's well because it, it became a corporate thing. Yeah. But when it was part of like the punk scene, it was like perfect. It, like it was functioning pro- And even then, it there was, and myself included, there was a lot of skepticism because it was introducing a lot of. Um, fringe the word. not fringe it was more no no I, I, everyone there was like quote unquote legit they were definitely committed to underground but it was very image and fashion conscious which it and again how I describe this obviously everyone started looking really good and it was very aesthetically pleasing but it also with that comes a lot of superficiality which then loses and it invites so for instance the idea of the hipster there was like the initial wave which was the vice but they were all underground bands like interpol the aes the rapture all the electro clash stuff they were basically punks who got into high fashion got cool haircuts and all that really cared about how they looked and they were hip but they were actually legit knew the scene. Then there's the second wave of people who wanted to benefit from the image that came from it, but they didn't have any connection to the hardcore scene. Right. So that's where the more commonly known hipster came from, which is basically a vapid shell of people who were getting all the puzzle pieces put together that would make them look appealing and get whatever benefits you but get. But they don't have that core initial... No fucking idea where any of the other shit came from. Right. And, and, and then that, that that Pandora's box was open, and it got into mainstream culture, and it's caused a lot of problems, in my opinion. Yep. Um, it, it just created a, a wave of confusion that we're still wrestling with. But um, where was it going? Oh, yeah, but then again... at Oh, you were saying it's important to bring things in. Yeah, I, th- I think now that I'm thinking about it out loud, if those pillars of the scene, like the guy from Death or Brad from Caden, are pulling it in, that's when it's functioning properly. And there's no limit to what you can pull in. And again, the hard, you can hear it in the vast sound of the hardcore scene. It has everything in there. Like a blow, because most people would think, Hardcore as a music sound is, is probably just like loud, chunky guitars and you know swinging arms. Yep. If they, um, oh, what's like a modern uh, Paramore, for instance, like very poppy. I mean, that's yep. all influenced by the hardcore scene. Most people wouldn't. Which is wild see that, to think about, but, but it's all influenced by it. Um, so yeah. It's an, that's cool. It's a deep resonance with me. I like the... Yeah, you have like, a fucking vast knowledge of yeah, music. I've, <laughs> I've participated I could sit here and talk time. to you for five hours, I know. Yeah, All right, I gladly will. But uh, yeah, I don't want to dominate it with <laughs> that. We can, no, it's uh, great. Continue. I love it. Um, yeah, actually, I was going to I was gonna come back to a topic that you were talking about because you, you started talking about uh, the... the Transition from Tool being an underground band and oh, then oh, yeah. seeing them play with James yeah. Addiction, I think. So no, I saw I saw James Addiction play. So there was that point in time where, where like I was, I was describing with the hipster, the mainstream who liked the image of Tool dominated the space, and I was out. It was literally that show. Right. And like at that moment, I had to like rescue my girlfriend at the time from this, you know, meathead dude. I was like, this is over time to go and you know i still i bought the the following tool records since and they were all decent the music remained fine but the culture it just it was that and it came a dirty secret for a lot of people like oh i'm not part of that i didn't care like i never had anything to prove to anyone so i listened the way i listened to so culturally speaking at that point in time it went off into a whole ridiculous uh trajectory same with change addiction uh, I was using a band like Primus too. Fuck yeah, dude! I Initially, love Left Claypool. That was like a skater, like under, and then eventually it, um, it makes sense. So eventually it became like, a, like Fish and all that kind of scene. It was like a hippie jamboree kind of band. 
Um, which again, if you if people were in it for like the intense mosh pit skater stuff, Primus culture had no more meaning to those people. Right. And that went off. I would say it went off in a genuine direction though, because that really was Lift Club was very like bohemian hippie kind of dude, very quirky, um, which. I can see a lot of influence in to, uh, from Primus in Tool. I don't know yeah, if that's all, only All me. of them... Um, so the second or third Lollapalooza, I went to that one too. Tool was playing the second stage because they were still an underground band. Rage Against the Machine paid the main scene. I believe Maynard came and sang because there's a song on that first Rage Against the Machine record where Maynard sings on it. Ah, yes. Um, know Your Enemy? I don't, I'm actually not a huge Raising a Machine fan, but I remember when I came out. But yeah, whatever that was, I remember. And Henry Rollins was on it too, also Black Flag and all that history. Um, but yeah, so that show, Tool was still like a unknown quantity. Raising a Machine was starting to be known. And and at that point, that lob was, was still underground. Uh, Primus played that. Alice in Chains played that. From 242, an industrial band was on it. Dinosaur Jr., great band. Yep. Um, I have a friend who fucking loves them. Oh, they're great. Yeah, he's from Massachusetts area. Uh, God, who else? Um, Arrested Development. Mm-hmm. So it's to- like speak to like the total vastness of what the underground scene was at that point, and it was still functioning, from my observation, in a healthy way. But it, again, once I guess we'll say the market gets a hold of it, and then the I hate the term normie what people call them, you know, like, people call someone who's just into mainstream stuff, when they, that person gets a hold of it, the culture just becomes diluted and loses its, its, uh, you know, potency. And that, that's and what I saw happen with Tool at that time. I it's don't know. so beyond the musician's control. Like, yeah. what do you do well, about that? Uh, well, that's why Nirvana was, and, and even Nine Inch Nails for that matter, uh, Trent Reznor was someone I always respect and still do. They doubled down on the harshness. So Nirvana would do things where they'd be invited on, you know, like whatever the late night show was at the time. Uh, I always forget their names. And they'd play the wrong song. they say, oh, you got to play the hit. And instead they'd play, like, you know, territorial pissings or something and destroy their shit on stage. So make it as, and <clears throat> they'd yeah. make it as little, it, the, the least uh, uh, stomachable as they possibly yeah, well, could well, they, for me. They're still listening. playing all this stuff that people embrace them for, but they're leaning into the stuff that the, the underground the, shit. Just the vibe of it, like they're gonna deliver it the way the underground appreciated for, which was exciting on the people. main stage. And, and that's exciting for people who are still tethered to that scene. They're like, oh, that's so cool. They're like, they're doing oh, it. They're holding their ground <laughs> there. Um, yeah, actually, I remember before uh, Nirvana's Rape Me became an official known release, there was some MTV, like, I don't know, New Year's Eve bands playing thing, and I remember Nirvana, he, he, Kurt Cobain started singing the beginning of Rape Me, before anyone knew what that song was, when they went to their set, and it was, again, one of those moments, like, oh my god, the word rape on TV. Right. Yeah, so that's how those bands did that. Other bands, I think they just... That's coming they, right off of the times, like, the PMRC stuff and everything, like the Tipper Gore Oh, yeah, the the, generation. the um the labels they put on all the CDs. The so time. him coming out and doing that was a yep. big oh, middle finger. That's, that's <laughs> how those bands did that. Some of them just fit properly into the place they were in and didn't really need to change much. Um, some, I would argue, embraced it. I'd say Smashing Pumpkins, particularly Billy Carter, and embraced it, and it just became like a goofy, like, uninteresting band. Yeah. Um, guy's a brilliant musician. Right. Very creative, but it's just, the stuff sucks. Um, Soundgarden, he's, oh, he died, didn't he? Or did Chris, yeah. Did Chris Cornell. Chris I mean, Cornell. He, yeah, he, I mean, the guy's phenomenal artist. What a talent. But he made sense in Hot. That, that, you know, guy belonged in an opera hall playing this stuff. So they were going on the so property. That, that end of it is confusing to me because I grew up poor as shit. And my idea is, like, if I could make great money playing music, doing something I fucking love, I would. Yeah. You know? I want to change my whole family dynamic and everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I want to I wanna buy my mom a house. I want to, you know... Yeah. 
Drive a new car. It's again, it's all about at what cost. Now, that's it's kind of like the deal with the devil, metaphorically speaking. Yes, and I have thought about that many times. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do that. Yeah. It's just again remaining tethered to where the integrity is. That's being the martyr. Is knowing where the truth is. If someone is doing the because so, I think this is a very common Hollywood story. I think Marilyn Monroe by this lesson. This may even segue into the REBT stuff. There is this notion, if I just get these certain things in the environment set up, if I just get enough people to tell me I'm pretty, then I will have some of them out and I will be happy. Yeah. And so obvious what happens is, okay, so now you literally have the entire world celebrating you. You are a cold day celebrity. They're saying... You're the you're the richest. You're the prettiest. And then they look at themselves in the mirror, saying, "Why am I still not like? Why am I still depressed? Why am I even more depressed?" And and now you have to keep up that fucking image. Well, it's a really rough thing to be, right? So now, so at least when you're poor or struggling, cause like, well, of course you're depressed. Like you got my solidarity. You're now it's you have no right to be depressed. You're rich, you have everything you're I want. Pretty. And then now, again, if they buy into this irrational belief that they should be something or they need to be a certain way, then they're going to make themselves ashamed and guilty. And it just becomes so intense that they off themselves. Cause it, it, Do you ever see King of Comedy? Um, Robert De Niro's a That's the yeah, Scorsese movie. movie. Very long ago. Yeah. So I, I don't remember. It's like all that in a movie. Okay. But that That's the like common story. It's been there forever. Is is There is... If you're trying to quote unquote make yourself feel better by changing stuff around you you're missing the point because it, it turns out um and yeah if 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 you'd allow and if you think it's not I, I can explain how this kind of ties into this clinical stuff i'm i'm obsessed with uh, rabt but i mean i this is you know there's data behind this and i believe it is true is we don't get depressed. Stuff doesn't make us depressed, anxious, or feel unhealthy. We literally make ourselves that way. That doesn't mean that it's because that's the case. It's easy to turn it on and off. But a lot of people believe it's circumstances that make us feel these things. And it's literally, it's not that. It's what we tell ourselves about those circumstances. And what we tell ourselves can literally be distilled to statements. So in the case of, uh, you know, celebrity that came from, let's say, very adverse circumstances, they may have believed, first of all, believed that it's possible to be a good or a bad person, like someone worthy of celebrity. And, and in order to know if you're good, you need approval of others. You right. need that feedback. So until I'm on every billboard and everyone's telling me I'm pretty, I will never believe it. And then they get there and they still don't believe it because they falsely believe that I need others to tell me I'm worthwhile in order to be worthwhile. That's predicated upon a false belief that it's even possible to be universally good, which would mean literally everything you do, everything about you would be evaluated as good under all circumstances, under all conditions, in the subjective opinion of all people across all time. It's impossible. We're too complex to be a good or a bad person. We can do things that most people we interact with in societies, uh, you know, that are of value to us will say that action is bad or good, and we may agree with them, but that's that's the best we can get. So, um, and you you actually, it may help if you ask questions, because I'll get super tangential with this stuff, but I guess what I'm getting at is with the idea of the celebrity that summits them out and then kills themselves or, or you know becomes depressed like it's they're operating under this false notion that they can um buy themselves happiness earn themselves happiness and but it's, it's supposed to be something from within not from the outside yeah, and, and it's less about making yourself happy it's more about not elevating your negative emotions to an unhealthy status that is the hard part of all of it because it's so easy to take because I I have my own struggles with uh, I don't even know if it's depression because I'm not like clinically diagnosed with anything but it's like you don't need to be clinically diagnosed with depression to experience all all humans experience depression the clinical diagnosis would 
if we're doing the DSM stuff, would mean that you're experiencing a level of depression that, um, you know, like major depressive disorder. You'd have to meet certain psychometrics in order to qualify as that. What are those? Um, I, I, who knows what the latest DSM thing is, but probably for major depression, you'd have to rate mm. on some kind of uh, depression index, like a Beckian depression index of having a certain level, you know, if they do it on a scale of one to five, five being the most severe, one being uh, a non-issue, enough of the time. So it's really about consistency, how often it's happening, and how intense it is. Okay. So major depression would be like, most of the time I'm feeling as depressed as I possibly can feel. And that that's, it's serious. It's like, I can't get out of bed. I have interest in very little stuff. And, and you know, the... I have mixed feelings about diagnostics, mainly when it gets in the hands of the general public. I think diagnostics only really serve a good purpose when it's being used amongst clinicians who want yep. to collaborate to help their clients. Because it's easy to label yourself as something and let it ruin this, your fucking life. And this gets back to what I'm going to try to talk about with the RABT Rational Behavior Therapy, which posits that we make ourselves feel these emotions. But... Yeah, a diagnostic... That's so hard to wrap your head around if you're already in that hole of, I'm depressed, I'm bipolar, yeah. I'm this, I'm yeah, that, yeah, and yeah. you're self-diagnosing. And, and we'll, we'll hopefully walk through it, and, and I deal with you, and cut me off and ask questions, because that's how it'll work the best. But, yeah, so we all experience the big unhealthy negative emotions would be anxiety, depression, and anger. There's really, and I would say we'll add shame and guilt to that. So yeah. Those five things to me are the most salient when it comes to unhealthy negative emotions. Um, and maybe I should back up and kind of explain what I'm getting to with this REBT stuff. Does that work for you? Or? Yeah, yeah. All right. So this is one of my big I guess, hobby horse, for lack of a better term. Like I told you, I have an educational background in clinical psychology. I never ended up pursuing becoming a psychologist. That's a whole different story. But I always remained really... Um, uh, enthusiastic about not necessarily the field, but just uh, particularly clinical psychology, help, helping myself and humans feel better more of the time. Yep. <clears throat> and I kept on top of the you know the knowledge the best I could. But the one person who really resonated with me was Albert Ellis, who created in 1955 what's called, originally called a rational therapy, but eventually became called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, REBT. And that is the original form of what is now commonly called cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. So there's really two, as far as I'm concerned, relevant cognitive behavioral therapies. One is the original Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. And then about 10 years later, Aaron Beck created Beckian Cognitive Therapy. And the... <clears throat> The key behind, particularly rational mode behavior therapy, is what I just said is that it's not events in our lives that give birth to unwanted negative emotions like depression and anxiety. It's what we tell ourselves about those events. Yep. So, for instance, um, let's say an event happens. Uh, I was banking on getting a job. I really thought I was going to get it. This would change my life as far as I'm concerned. And I didn't get the job. Yeah. And now I'm depressed. Most people would think that losing the job, not getting the job, made me depressed. So in, in a rational or behavioral model, um, they'll lay it out what he calls the ABCs of RABT. Um, a stands for uh, sometimes called an adverse event or an activating event. Yep. So A Which would, would be the not getting the job. I didn't get the job. That just that happened. Yep. Measurable, like you either have it or you don't. We can scientifically measure it. And also, by the way, this is all rooted. The reason it's called rational thinking. It's it's rooted in um, logic, evidence-based thinking, reason, science. So everything that um, the techniques and the the philosophy, for lack of a better term, is is purely governed by fact. Fact. Yep. And the idea is if your thinking doesn't comport with fact, more more importantly, your thinking is is out of line with reality um, and often is represented in the terms of demands like shoulds, oughts, musts. So definitive statements that lack definitive evidence. So for instance, I must get that job. It's an irrational belief. Like yeah. I need to get that job in order to be happy. 
if that were true, we could literally measure it. Like every single person who got that job would have to be happy after they got it or would be unhappy upon not getting it. So, and we can walk through it. So A, I didn't get the job. B, you hold a belief about it. Most of the time we don't realize a belief because we're really focusing on C, the consequence. The consequence is going to be emotional and behavioral. So there's two. The emotional consequence in this case would be depression, maybe even anxiety, like, shit, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. Like, I'm feeling anxious. I'm depressed because, you know, wherever. I'm going to get my car repoed because I don't have a job now. Exactly. Now, again, the, but the, the feeling is the depression, the like, and that, that can be quantified in terms of, like, lack of appetite, feeling that overall sense of, like, gloom and negative anxiety is you can be physically quantified your heart rates up you're, you're having a hard time sleeping you're more jittery you're so those are the cons- emotional consequences with that can become behavioral consequences i may be drinking more i may be uh, snapping at people more um i may whatever a lot of behaviors again people think those behaviors and um, emotions are created by the loss of the job, but there's this B that happens in between, a belief. We're saying something to ourselves. Often we're unaware of it. And there's two types of beliefs, a rational belief and an irrational one. The rational belief, or let's say philosophy, is usually in the form of a statement, I didn't get the job. This really sucks. I really wish it wasn't the case. I, you know, it's a lot of words like want, Des- words of desire, not words of demand. Right. And because of that, I feel, and usually the feeling that's associated with the desires or lack thereof is not going to be depression, it'll be frustration, which is a healthy negative emotion. It won't be anxiety, you'll be concerned. Like, shit, I really wanted that, I'm not happy, and I'm really concerned. So that's a rational belief. Like, the rational belief comes in the form of non absolute statements. Uh, like I know I don't. There's nothing saying I don't deserve the job. I deserve the job, but I didn't get it, and I wish it wasn't the case. So like, right. the irrational belief is in the form of absolutes. I needed to get that job. I must get that job. I should have done better. I should have gotten. There's a thing I'll talk about the tyranny of the shoulds, which Albert Ellis would talk about, which I think harkens to Karen Horn, I, which is another psychologist who wrote about it. But that's the irrational statement. It's a definitive statement that lacks evidence. Because if you should have gotten that job. Upon not getting it, something predictable would always happen. You die. Like, there are scientific things. Like, I need to drink water or else I will die. I should have looked both ways before I crossed the street. Correct. Now, now should gets. when I talk to people about this, people get a little tripped up with the word should because colloquially, I can't, oh, I actually kind of said that right. That's a tough word to say. There's we use the word should not always in an absolute sense, but when REBT talks about it, it, when they say should, it's meaning that not like a predictive should, like this should work if I open this and drink. It's this should work, meaning that it needs to work. So when you're using an absolute should, it's really saying must is probably the better word. Like this must happen. Yeah. And scientifically speaking, in an experiment, it would always happen every time that. So that's the irrational belief. I should have got. I must. Like before, I must get the job, and because I didn't get the job, I am now doomed. Or like, so there's a prediction in there. That belief is giving birth to the C, the unhealthy negative consequences. It's right. Provable. So is this where the like idea? Because I've actually heard this before. Um, going through. What I am really trying not to label as depression, but it might be actually depression. Um, well, don't like remove the stigma from it. Depression, and we'll get into probably why you're resisting it. Everyone experiences it at one point or one level. Not be like being depressed. It's literally an emotion that comes in anytime someone feels bad. They may label that that's depression. Negative feeling. Yeah. Now it's different than. Sadness. Sadness is the healthy negative belief. Right. Sadness, and the way you know is it doesn't dominate your life. It won't really overwhelm you. It won't linger after the activating event. That's the separation of it, I think, with me, because I, I have had certain times. I I think I'm getting better at it, but it's it's like this 
I I'll so, something small will happen, and then I then have this domino effect. Of, my guess is, having spoken to you, this is very common. A lot of depression is a result of anxiety. Anxiety is often the result of looped thinking, really obsessing. Not even act like it's just not just not being able to lose focus on something. Often it's something negative, a worry. So concern is healthy. Anxiety is is inefficient concern. You're obsessing over it. So yeah. uh, usually it's money, relationships, uh, health. And the concern would be, I really am concerned. I, 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 it's really important I find a way to get some cash coming in because there are going to be measurable, likely will be measurable negative results. That's all going to give birth to concern, which is good because that will motivate, concern's healthy, it will motivate you to get cash. Anxiety becomes counterproductive because you're more focused on the it negative I need than actually doing. Cash. Like I don't have it. It's going to be terrible. What if this and that? Blah, 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 blah. That becomes so overwhelming that you start to get depressed because you feel despair. Because now suddenly the world feels like is anything ever going to work, right? Right. It's all the cards are stacked against me, and I can't do anything to it, fucking change it. And that. then beliefs come in there. Like that was a definitive belief. Really, what do you mean know? Like, can we prove it? Can we measure it? Is anyone else in your position going to get the outcome? And I'll get to the other things that we'll get eventually get the shame and guilt which come in the way. Those, those are feelings that most people experience too. Um, all reinforced by uh, almost all societies, for lack of a term, memetics, basically these common sayings and beliefs we have reinforce a lot of this shit. So it's baked into the fabric of our language, the way we talk, particularly the idea of good and bad people, false belief. The right. fact that we need the approval of others, especially ones we care about, in order to feel to be good, happy, false. People can make me angry, false. They're right. It's all, all, there's, that's crazy to think about all, right there. People like, like, I already know when people are like, that's ridiculous. This guy's fucking out of his mind. Of course people make you angry. What about that time that guy did that? No, but that, that makes sense because I have listened to other uh, people in the field of psychology talk about that, like how... Um, if you're dealing with a certain person, just remove that idea from your thought process. Like, oh, you've, you're making me uncomfortable. Yep. No, you're making you uncomfortable. Yeah. Now, it's a thought pattern. Yeah, you're letting the thing that they're doing make you uncomfortable. If you don't give them that, they don't get the fucking correct. mental cookie for doing it. And now I'll jump now. Often, again, because we think in absolutes, when people hear that, then they're going to say, oh, Dave, you're sick. therefore it's just as easy as not making yourself uncomfortable. No, our brains literally are inefficient. They're irrational. We're, we, we are, our natural state is to think, at, at least according to what Albert Ellis uncovered and what seems to be supported by data, our propensity is to think irrationally, to use emotional-based reasoning rather than um, uh, evidence-based reasoning. Right. I think it has to do with like the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system and all that shit. But getting all the biology and that nonsense aside, it, it, it just it's quite evident that um we more often than not will feel quote unquote comfortable thinking irrationally. Thinking in terms of good and bad people. Thinking in terms of if that person calls me that word, that means that they're making me sad, angry, whatever. Even though no one takes a moment to think like well, what if someone says it to you in a language you don't understand? Wouldn't that magically mm. make you feel... Well, why don't they weaponize words in the military? That would completely destabilize the <laughs> Just say those words at them, and that would... Like, what a brilliant weapon. You you win the war by saying yeah. you're ugly. Yep, exactly. Or, or the real bad words that we no longer can say, the Voldemort words. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what we're getting is, is we do make ourselves feel these emotions, but it's very difficult not to. So that's why, hence, a discipline like REBT was created in reaction to the dominant uh, mode of psychotherapy at the time, which was psychoanalysis, which, as far as Albert Ellis' uh, experience and what seemed to be proven, it wasn't yielding measurable results. He would say, people would feel better after my session, but they weren't getting better. I don't want, like, I want this person who's coming to me because he's too scared to ask out someone on a date to stop doing that right i don't care Change what, the pattern. i don't care what happened with his father and mother how often he's on my couch like we're getting deep and we're learning shit but he still hasn't 
like he was thinking in terms of results. I think that's still a problem today in psychology. It's a, I, I, I'll get to that whole thing. Like I'm actually very the the whole industry or practice is it, it's fun. I sorry. Oh, that's right. I um that would be a whole other tangent. I I, I think that. I've actually got, just the reason I said that is because I've gone through it. Like I've gone to therapy yeah. and literally like in the moment I'm like, wow, oh wow, this weight is lifted off my shoulders, and then they're like, time's up, yeah, see you later, and, and like I feel like shit for the rest of the time, yeah. and then I come back. My brother struggles with that too. So when it is working, it's not because of a magical therapeutic alliance between the patient and, or the client. I, the patients are shit work. That would really apply to a clinic. The client and therapist. It's because circumstantially the conversation, which again, there are good techniques a lot of therapists have, will inspire the client to think in a rational, in a rational way, or more importantly, defeat certain irrational beliefs, which then give birth, to defeat the negative emotions they're struggling with. So, and that's what Albert Ellis realized, and that's what I see. It's, it's not, therapist isn't a magician. It's ultimately the individual that's doing this. And this goes back to where Alvarez drew his inspiration from, from the Stoic philosophers, particularly Epictetus, and the big one was Marcus Aurelius. Yep. So. I'm not super well versed on neither, either of them, but I, I love what I have read about. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it, the it, stuff it, it, Marcus Aurelius wrote is still to this day it, like it, super it, relevant. Well, and it's baked into our culture, it's baked into Western culture, and in the East you'll see very similar things coming from Buddhism. It's it's yeah. all humans, you know. Every now and then you'll have these very, like, exceptional human beings who are, those neurons are tightly wound, and they're just, like, they come up with things right in the book, and it just, like... That lasts pu- forever. Yeah, and it pushes people forward, but then you will have the collaboration of humanity working at it, and then it just gets woven into our cultural fabric, and we benefit from it. So, chances are there's all these things that came from Marcus Aurelius and a number of philosophers from, you know, that part of the world, Greece. Would you say these are like the the, the roots Rome. of psychology? Well, so the roots of psychology, as we Not know, to sidetrack you, I want to yeah, hear what the point know, was. Well, so, so this was actually, no. So the roots of psychology was, was mainly Sigmund Freud, it was Carl Jung was his... his, his uh, and, and his student. Like, and, and Freud's discovery is mind-boggling. Now, psychoanalysis as a practice, a therapeutic practice, has not proven, as far as I'm concerned, to yield the results that I think most people are looking for out of therapy. But his discovery of the unconscious mind, the subconscious mind, just, just, just basically, it, it, it was a renaissance. So that wasn't Jung's discovery. That was Jung was working off of the foundation that he Freud built. He was a psychoanalyst. He was an analyst, and he got more into like the mystical elements. It's actually a really cool movie. Dreams and yeah, dream. Well, and dream analysis is a part of psychoanalysis, and the idea is that's going to give insight into what your thinking is and blah blah blah. Again, he got a lot into like symbolism and things like that too. And that, and and Jung took the ball and ran with it really in like the metaphysical, uh, religious direction. I would argue. And with Joseph Campbell. Yep. Yeah. The the hero's journey, the archetypes. Uh, <clears throat> I I get so heavy it, into that shit. Well, what's cool about that is I I mean Jung in terms of a or Jungian therapy or all that stuff, including psychoanalysis. As far as in, ter- in terms of a therapy that will yield the results we're looking for, I want to feel less of the time, I feel anxious less of the time, I want to stop doing destructive behavior, best of luck diving to that shit for the answers. To try and think through and understand the kind of like intangible aspects of existence and society and culture, to have like a lingua franca we can use or like a common tongue, Jung seems to have a lot of interesting things where we can... Uh, yeah, kind of like the spirit of stuff in humanity, he nails upon that. So like you said, like the fact that, like how would I immediately know that failure, that like connection, right. and, like why are those things, like, we don't really know, we can't quantify, we can't put it into some kind of formula where we can say there's a scientific evidence. But there's a pattern that's there that has just withstood the test of time. That's the young stuff. He's try- I think the mistake that's made is when, and this is usually a Western way of looking, when we want to 
apply the evidence-based aspect to it and treat it as a tool that would be evidence-based, that's when we get into trouble. So to have conversations to try to weave through the haze as we like kind of push our brains closer to a truth, that stuff's good. But when we get to actual truth telling, logic, logos, which is the language of reason, like it has to literally mathematically um, level out in the end. We can't do the Jungian stuff. We can't say, well, the reason I feel depressed is because, uh, you know, this energy is in me and I'm this kind of archetype. If we're going to be scientific about it, we have to say, well, where's the evidence? Well, all the books. And, uh, you know, usually when something's evidence-based, there usually isn't a well in response. It's like, well, here's the answer. So, anyway, right, I'm going on a bit of a tangent, but Jung was a Fine. very fascinating dude. Really, like, um, that's just a bit beyond me, but it's it's cool. But it's a lot of theory-based stuff, not necessarily all evidence-based stuff. If it was, we'd have it systematized by now and use right. it as a tool. Same with a lot of psychotherapy, and that's why I'm very passionate about it, particularly REBT, because it goes philosophically deep. It I mean, take someone like a Marcus Aurelius. That was yielding results in his behavior. He was able, a lot of those people were able to endure things that most humans would drive themselves mad in, in the face of. Um, soldiers are using this stuff. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> how are these people able to go into combat knowing there's a good chance they're going to die without just completely being overwhelmed by anxiety and depression? Right. The techniques they use are cognitive and behavioral. They, and in a lot of instances, they're seeking raw data. So I remember hearing an interview of a soldier saying, I know the physical reality of entering into a room with X amount of people with X amount of weapons, the statistical likelihood that one of those bullets will strike a vital organ and kill me. And because I go into that room knowing that, that results in a level that allows me to focus. Whereas if I don't have any data, and I'm just saying I'm going to die without any data, you're just going to make yourself panic. Right. Now, because you're panicked, you're more likely to die because you're going to freeze up. So, <clears throat> it's being prepared. Yep, and it's just it's just being as much in line with reality as possible because that's going to better your chances of succeeding. Because if you don't know what the landscape is, the literal physical landscape, you're flying blind. You may get lucky. I think the Marine Corps uses a a phrase that's something along the lines of proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. Yeah, that makes sense. And the proper preparation would be getting as much evidence-backed data as possible in your head. That's why I always say, I, you always hear, like, fall back on your training, fall back on your training. Well, the reason, Fundamentals. Yeah, and like in jujitsu, like, we're not just feeling out an armor. There's clearly a physical way where it is at its approaching perfection. Yep. And there's always inconsistency because everyone has different length arms and bones and flexibilities, but they're clearly the players and the practitioners and the professors of this art have figured out through trial and error and comparing notes that there is just a way you align your body most of the time under most conditions to get the highest chance of that coming out. And now we can prove it through fight after fight after fight. And that's all data. Side note, I have an incredible detail that I know it works now because I broke professor's grip today. Uh, Tim, well, like he wasn't letting me do it. Um, he, and Rashawn, uh, one of the purple belts that we work with was like coaching me along the way. He just showed it to me today, you know, and I'm not bragging on anything because Tim definitely submitted me about 15 times oh, no, in 15 that, seconds. That, that accomplishment on its own is worthy of... Yeah, of dude, bragging. I was like, I'm taking this and I'm running away now. Um, <laughs> but I, I got, I broke the grip and he, he even was like, that was, that was exactly what you need to do with that technique. That was great. Um, and I was like super proud walking away from that. You know, I didn't get the arm bar, but... Um, he is a wizard and magically turned it into a submission of his own. Yeah. So that the, well, you know keeping it in context for you know he's a black belt. So yeah, exactly. You know he yeah he's teaching me these things. So but uh my I was just gonna say and I'm now see we're both going on tangents. It's not it's just good. you no, don't feel all, that. But what's nice is they're um, all interconnected and we can pull from them as the conversation progresses. But I'm gonna show you that shit tomorrow and you're gonna love it. Nice. Either tomorrow or the next day, whenever you're training next. But uh, oh yeah, Tuesday, yeah, awesome. We were uh, oh, we're talking about how there's just, like a, a right way or not a right like a way that's gonna probabilistically yield a yes, predictable being prepared. Result. Yep. So getting back to the Al Reales' approach in REBT, 
he was looking for provable results, measurable results. He went back to the Stoic philosophy, which had measurable results in the sense that these people were reporting that they were able to change their emotional landscape without any conditions around them changing. They were relying on nothing more than their internal philosophy. So he integrated that through the lens of a clinician who now has the understanding of, you know, what is anxiety. Because the Stoics had no idea where it was coming from. As far as they were concerned, it was like the humuses in the body were in balance and... You know, your black bile from your third liver was in your head. So that, it was a weird shit. Very archaic. Yeah, and, and, but nonetheless, the shit they accomplished was better than what all these scientists had done up to that point with psychoanalysis. So, anyway. It's so wild how far they took their their knowledge. and It's, and it's so cool. I mean, it, should, but it shows... Actually, this speaks to... This actually ties into being a punk, a martyr, whatever you want to call it. Albert Ellis, New Yorker, from Bronx, you know, this was the 50s, and he's saying stuff like fucking shit at a time where, like, he was, like, the punk rocker of psychology. So nice. when he presented people with complaints... Even more of a reason so, for me to watch. He's so crass and by, he's got, like, the New York accent, but, like, he didn't give a fuck. He just wanted results. So when he actually first presented his theory to the ABA, they laughed him out the door. Came back again next year. And this became, like, the... Cognitive behavior therapy is like the method that is known to work as effectively as uh, pharmaceuticals. And there's data behind this. I've actually, so it's familiar to me just that term, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, because I believe I was watching something on depression with Jordan Peterson talking. Yeah, yeah Peterson will bring that up too. And he was literally like, if you're going to go see a psychologist, See one of those psychologists. Now, and then the problem with that is there's a lot of people calling themselves that. Probably like there's a lot of people calling themselves. There's Brazilian money in it. Jiu-jitsu, you know, masters, and then... There's Nick Dojo's in psychology, too. There, I would say the majority of it is that, and, I, and I'm getting That's what makes why. it so fucking hard to find a good doctor. This is the beauty. I don't... And I think... This is going to be real fucking out there. I think AI may... I'm going to pursue this. The answer to helping us get the benefits of this. I think, so, what I'm describing in RET, it's so streamlined and so simple, it's almost laughably simple. So even in the, in the context of an REBT therapist, they're more of like a teacher. They're helping you learn these techniques, which you can learn on your own. So if you buy and read the, A Guide to Rational Living by Albert Ellis or one of his many books, if you read through those techniques and practice them, and you doing it successfully, they will yield the same results that would happen in the context of a psycho of a REBT practitioner. And being done properly, and this this will sound ridiculous, but we're talking a handful of sessions to eliminate ma like major shit, like like panic induced anxiety, PTSD kind of stuff. And again, this sounds like the big pitch, like oh, it's so perfect. And, but this stuff is measurable because the difference between someone experiencing that depression, which may have been with them for decades right. or not, is the moment you kill that driving irrational belief. And maybe that thing gets untangled by 20 years of psychoanalysis and, you know, you think it took 20 years, like you need those 20 years to do it. But literally the second you experience something or read something or hear something that inspires you to shatter that belief, that is the second that depression is gone. You'll often hear this actually, one perfect example is you'll hear about um, people who are devoutly religious to yeah. a belief system because they were just, in, you know, encouraged, propagandized into it. It wasn't, they think, or, or maybe they propagandized themselves through reading. And the, and, and, and fundamentalist meaning that they believe it to the word. Like that, it's not just they have a spiritual sense. They think that... The book is literal. The book is literal. And that guy is absolutely real. And they're not taking no for an answer. And because of that, they are experiencing certain things, like certain fears. Like, if I don't do this thing God X said, then I'm going to go to hell, which entails all this shit. So therefore, I am scared out of my fucking gourd right. that if I don't do this, and I'm experiencing panic level anxiety, I'm experiencing depression. And that, at a religious level, that can be all of your life. So now, religious thinking, 
by definition, in, if you're in the scientific realm, is irrational thinking. Hmm. You're you're holding a belief based on faith or how you feel. That doesn't mean religion. But it's no commentary. It's literally definitively speaking. So when we think religiously, and that doesn't even have to be in the spiritual realm, a religious or an authoritarian belief, like meaning that I must do this. There is yeah, this is the right way to do it. You and if you don't, there's a consequence. You're gonna make yourself depressed and anxious when that thing shit. Yeah. So that's the irrational belief. So back to the B and the ABC. A, something happens. Like, I need the approval of my parents. If mom and dad don't approve of me or disapprove even worse, that means I'm bad or I'm doing something bad and I'm probably bad and that's going to be terrible. Hear all these things? That's going to be terrible. It's bad. And surprise, surprise, mom and dad said my new business venture sucks. I'm an idiot. They just told me, and I feel really depressed because they made me depressed. Or that that event made me depressed. You just might have unpleasable parents. It doesn't even matter. It's not even about your parents. It's because you believe you need approval of other people to feel good and be a good person. Again, like I said earlier. A this, this is almost reminding me of like Nietzschean... It's it. They all all the philosophers pull from the same shit because okay. it's, it's it's all logical. The second philosophy, because at the base of philosophy is is logic. It's literally math. I remember like one of the most difficult classes in my at my school was literally the logic of philosophy, which is a math class. It just blew people probably because. We think irrationally, so just to like actually make a lot of concrete shit. Yeah, and you have to prove it. It's like, all right, so you're 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 saying this is true. I'm saying it is absolutely true that the reason I'm depressed is because my mom and dad didn't like what I'm doing with my business. That's a true statement. Well, I gotta prove it. So where's all the the the, the pieces? Um, is, is there some kind of like you know, metaphysical thing we can point to that when that happened, that or let's just do a test. Like if your mom and dad disapproved of your friend's business, will your friend be depressed? Well, no, it's different. Well, why is it different? Is it the words they said? Is it the belief they hold? What is it? And as you just pick it apart, pick it apart conceptually, you realize that this is fucking idiotic. This makes no sense. Right. So what is going on? And that's where Albert Ellis came and said, oh, it's because you're telling yourself these idiotic rigid authoritarian beliefs like I need this in order to that. And you're being your own you're, tyrant. You're setting yourself up to hit the wall over and over again. So this, now, getting back to ABC, here's where the, the therapy comes in. There's the D part. So A, activating event, B, belief, C, consequences. D is the disputing part. You literally take, you for, once you identify that irrational belief and the way you know it's irrational is because there's a should, must, ought. And, and you, you, you have to be honest with yourself saying, do I really believe this is the case and you may part of you probably won't deep in there you're like i'm not sure but yeah the dominant part of me really does believe i need my parents approval to be happy so i do i'm going to write that down all right now start start arguing with it either argue against it or prove it usually for a lot of people it's trying to prove it does the work because then they're like well if it's so true it'll be easy to prove right right you just keep doing it. You keep doing it. Some people, it's right away they may have an epiphany and boom, done. Oh, I don't. And then more bullshit will come out beneath it. Okay, I got rid of that irrational belief. Now there's this other one. But that's all it is. is literally linguistically mm -hmm. defeating that belief. We do this all the time without realizing it. And so back to the, the religious fanatic, you'll often hear stories. They're like, I remember that one line of Carl Sagan that I read. That moment, I went from being a true believer, I couldn't hold on to it. And whatever it was about how Sagan articulated this thing about the cause or something, just took that deep belief to task, and they couldn't hold on to it. And suddenly, suddenly hell is no longer an anxiety issue, because like, it, it just doesn't make sense, it can't exist. Right. It's literally in that own instance. Now, it may take a long time to get to that revelation, but the literal therapy happens within seconds. So a very adept therapist would help you identify that and help you defeat it. You have to openly believe the argument against it. But once you do, and ironically, you're propagandizing yourself to believe the truth. So you have to, like, wash yourself in the arguments against the irrational belief. You're relearning truth. Yeah. So, I mean, literally the practice often is just writing it down every day. 
Um, Marcus Aurelius would do his meditations, I guess, in the yep. morning. Say, this is the same thing. You're literally doing disputing. Like some people would say, do it three minutes a day. It seems evident that within 30 days of consistent disputing, that will kill the belief. Now, that's not always true because you may not be disputing well. It may be a very convoluted, very, you know, ironically, the more intelligent and adept you are at language, most people think that will make it easier for you to get better. It makes it harder for you to get better. You build these layers of argumentation and bullshit around these beliefs. Whereas if you're not doing that, it's just raw nerve bullshit belief that you can carve down. But in 30 days, the argument is that's what it takes. And it turns out, if, if I'm hearing or reading and hearing, in 30 days, that's how long it would take to re kind of architect your neurochemistry to reshape, you know, your connections and everything. And I think just humanity has figured this out through meditation and all that stuff. Um, that you're, <clears throat> you hold certain beliefs long enough, it, it, it's helping you on a biological level. So now the juices aren't adding insult to injury. So for the beginning, it's going to feel unnatural to you because you're awash in these, these chemicals in your brain that, that's just how you feel. So in, in a weird way, we think these false beliefs are good for us. And that's why we fight to hold on to them. So we think that anytime I hear like a creak at the front door at midnight, it means I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. Which is like, it's, if that's it's true, irrational. That, if that's true, you should be dead then. If it, ha if it happens, it happens all the time. But like, you know, or, uh, I'm absolutely, like, I'm terrified of driving because it, it, it's dangerous. Okay, what do you mean? Yeah, statistically speaking, people die in cars, but, you know, I, I didn't know as you're not getting at the cars, but you, uh, you know, pick some other stupid thing people do that's really, that's more dangerous, which on its own proves that they're not actually concerned about the injury. They're more concerned about holding on to this ridiculous belief right. that they think is preserving their life because, like, as long as I don't get into cars, I'm going to live forever. You know, even though I'm, uh, I don't know, like eating 8,000 calories a day and like 500 pounds overweight. But that's well, I've, right. I've met people that wouldn't get, uh, they would get in a car, but they wouldn't get on the highway. Yeah. And my thought on that, I get it because it's a completely different thing driving 30 miles an hour in a residential neighborhood and driving on the fucking freeway. Mm -hmm. It is different. Yeah. Um, and if you never take the leap and get on the freeway in a car, it's, it's intimidating. Yeah, and, and um, even when I first started driving, it was fucking intimidating. Oh, yeah, because the cars are zooming by you, and you have to, like, get in the lane and all that. But, but the, apparently most accidents happen close to home. And the reality of it is, um, I have seen horrendous car accidents in just residential neighborhoods. People coming back from the club or whatever, and they're shit-faced at midnight, and they crash into yep. a wall. I've, I've seen bad scenes, man, like that, and then I've seen... People crash on the highway going 70 miles an hour and fucking get out of the car and but that, but here walk around. That doesn't feel right, though, because our mind, like, that doesn't make sense. If the car is going like fucking Frogger, and then you're going to get crushed in there. But, but scientifically... The data says otherwise. Exactly, and that's and, the thing that's, that's, that's mind-blowing. And the second you know that, you, whether you realize that, suddenly your anxiety around it dissipates. It's so you fucking hard to do that, though. It Because it goes counter to our nature. And again, I... Thing. And you might have lived your whole and life I, thinking that way. And, and also, well, here's the other and part. And it, it might be the reason you think you're still alive. So I think there's two two things that stop people from doing this, especially when they come to learn of it, and it's normal. One is what we're describing. It's a false belief that these beliefs are, are helping you. And there are... Comfort. Yeah, it's, it's familiar. And, and often, especially when it comes to, like, beliefs about oneself, like, uh, you know, I can't be a failure, or whatever the fuck it is. There's a positive side to it, ironically, as much pain as it's causing, it at least shows a positive thing about you that you actually want to be better. Yeah. You want to do that's but There's consistency in it. Ironically, on your journey to do better, this is standing in the way. Now, here's the thing that I think really stops people. It's what Albert Ellis would call secondary disturbance. It's upsetting yourself, and you are upsetting yourself, about the acknowledgement that you're upset, that you're fucked up, that you're neurotic, which is a normal thing. And neurosis, by the way, uh, to clarify, so neurosis are the majority of 
unhealthy uh, negative emotions that people feel. So like not in the realm of psych psychotic delusions, hallucinations. Almost all people experience neurosis at some level. And the big ones, like I say, is uh, depression, anxiety, anger. And those are the results of our own creation. Which these aren't like the same. This isn't to be categorized with like everyday stress. Well, yes. Yeah. Everyday. Does well, it depend on the so, source of the stress? So there's stress. Well, here's the thing. We can think about it. Imagine um, two people experiencing the same event, like going into a... Uh, you know, Henzo's and having someone twice your weight, neon billowing your stomach. For some people who may have never done it, they're like, all right, well, whatever. Other people are like, I, I can't even conceive it. People who have been doing it, or, so there's, if, if the neon belly experience on its own was the thing that causes anxiety, everyone will experience the same level. So, like, you could think in terms of physical reality. Uh, even in terms of trauma, like trauma is when something has experienced repeated stress until there's a, a negative result that sticks, like bone trauma. You keep hitting on something and eventually it shatters. Now it's traumatized. Up until then, it's, it's, it's um, experiencing stress, like there's stress on the bone. Some people may have stronger bones than others. The, the hit may not be in the right position. But trauma is like that's a physical reality. That's not to your own doing. Um, in a psychological sense, it's similar. You've experienced something that's just so overwhelming to your psyche that, in that sense, it's broken. Like, it sticks with you after the event. The way you know something is um, an unhealthy negative emotion, like anxiety or panic, also is if you're experiencing particularly anger after the event has well over. You're fucking angry about something that happened 10 years ago. That's you, dude. And I've got some I don't shit care like that. How much your parents or friend did X, Y, Z, whatever they did to you, it doesn't matter. Killed your dog, killed this. Again, all events we don't like and we prefer not. You are the one. And actually, Albert Ellis would talk about anger. It's like drinking poison and thinking it's going to kill your enemy. And he may not. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even think he even came up, but I hear him say, I'm like, oh, that's a perfect way to describe That's a great it. metaphor. And, you know, so it shows we create those things. But. Yeah, in a physical sense, you can measure things that actually have cause the effect. So if someone, you know, cut my hand off, clearly the blade and the force and the like, you know, I didn't make my hand come off because I was thinking of that in a weird way. Right. But what I say to myself about it after, that could change everything. Right. I may That's... have a, I may have a weird belief that I came from a tribe where if my hand was severed, that means I'm the one. And I am fucking pumped. Once the pain, <laughs> I'm stoked. Pumped. Everyone it. else is like, I'm a guitarist. My <laughs> life's over. I'm depressed, and that made me depressed. It's all what you say to yourself, right? And, and your underlying philosophy is what dictates the emotions. So again, the therapeutic process of REBT, which again we are either taught through a therapist or learn on our own, is how to re-architect our. And this is the E part of ABC, the effective new philosophy. Re-architect our philosophical infrastructure so as base it's as much rooted in reality as possible. Meaning we're we're editing out all the uh, irrational beliefs, the definitive beliefs we hold that lack definitive evidence. We're gonna still have those. Our brains are gonna fight to hold on to them. But little by little, as we clean that plaque out, or it's like bugs in code, we get that out, we're going to operate more efficiently. Right. So again, like a person who up until recently believed in hell, and most of their life was dominated by that, the decisions to make what they felt, and they read that line of Carl Sagan, and suddenly the whole faith is shattered, they're way more efficient now. There, it may turn out there is an actual hell that we come to prove, but until the evidence is there, it's just not going to... You know, and, and again, how you respond to that is going to determine what emotions you have. Right. Um, so that that really is it in a nutshell. It's it's mm -hmm. extremely powerful, and I believe the way this works on an individual. I I think for I'm very passionate about introducing this to as far and as wide an audience as possible. I think in a strange way, it can only be done through propagandistic methods. So the same way, you hear this stuff like about how social media literally is shaping the way people respond to things. And it's just like the algorithm serving up certain things that yeah. are statistically known to make people, make people anxious or depressed. Right. 
whether it's a COVID thing or a guns thing. And it's just like... It, to keep your attention. Yeah. Whatever the reason is, it, you know, it, it just, it's no, we, they can measure saying every time we introduce this thing into this population, the response is this, predictably. You know, and so they can actually, so like, divide people. Interval that, that's, like, undeniable. So that's how, you know, and, and sometimes propaganda isn't, or whatever you want to call it, influence. It's not, I mean... I love that those two words are the same. Yeah, yeah it, it, <laughs> and, and, and I guess propaganda is just manipulating, um, uh, using language for a political gain. And sometimes you can actually... So this gets back to propagandizing yourself to believe the truth. Again, when I say the truth in an RBD sense, it's something that comports with logic. Yeah. So it's not an authoritarian truth just because a 9 out of 10 people say it's true. It's because it withstands a scientific process. It's evidence-based. It's, it always has a predictable outcome no matter who's running the experiment. So you like using propaganda to swear he would be like much in the same way Society has been propagandized, not even necessarily by an agenda, to believe there is such thing as a good and a bad person. It's doing the opposite. Literally putting that doubt out there, like, well, where's your evidence? Can you even define You're so confident that there's a bad person. What is that? Define it. Is it Bill Cosby? He did that bad thing, the rapey thing, right? Yeah. Is that making him a bad person? Because before he was a good person. Did he turn to a bad person? Can he be good and bad at the same time? Right. Or is it really that... We're doing things and thinking things, and I think it's probably better to focus on the actions and the thoughts. Yep. Because thoughts, just because someone thinks bad things about you doesn't mean, like, I always often, yeah, I don't give a fuck what someone thinks about me, I care about what they're going to do about it. Right, that. thinking about smacking you is way yeah. different than getting now, up and smacking someone. That information is good to know because that's often uh, a pretty important prerequisite for them to actually smack me. But then, but th to know they think about that literally does nothing to me. Right. So that gets the approval thing. I'm like, oh, why do they want to smack me? It's because I'm a bad person. We're back to the bad person. So if we're focusing on rate, and this is where we get to ourselves before we rate others, is um, focusing on rating aspects of us, our performance. The problem is we make the mistake of rating ourselves and others. And this is how we make ourselves guilty and ashamed and angry and genocidal. Um, this will actually transition into the second important part of our ET. He teaches uh, this notion of uncondition unconditional acceptance. Um, unconditional acceptance of the self, unconditional acceptance of others, and unconsist uh, unconditional acceptance of life. So it's USA, UOA, and ULA. Unconditional acceptance is not the same as unconditional positive regard. People, when they hear that, saying, oh, well, you're going to accept this person for eating babies? It's like, no, no, no. You have no choice but to accept what is and has happened. That doesn't mean you, don't, you, you have to like it, and it doesn't mean you don't have to do anything about it. But you're, you're, you're but if you're trying not, to accept the if things If you're going to say, I control. demand that didn't happen, you're just going to fuck your shit up. And right. furthermore, you're going to be more concerned, and you'll see this with, in society, People seem more concerned with getting everyone to agree person X is bad than they are with stopping the person from doing action Y, which seemingly is a reason you're calling them bad. Right. So they're more interested. Like they, they, you know, people will be, you know, if if you say, well, what if we get them to stop action Y, but you can no longer call them bad anymore? Oh no 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 no, they're still a bad person. But like, aren't the reason we're concerned is this person's like you know, chopping off baby's limbs. Like, and I'm not saying we don't pursue justice after. Obviously, there's a whole other, you know, aspect dealing it. But aren't we more concerned with them to get this person from, to stop doing that than calling them a bad person? And right. it's just because we believe in the good... And that's... Because and then that's, there's this, that tribal aspect of it, too, where it's like people like to be right. People like to feel like they're a part of a group and they feel like pointing the finger. I'm happy you mentioned that because this, so I'll go back to the USA, the unconditional, so this gets to the holy trinity of um, RABT. There's these three insights that Ellis identified in his years of therapy that are, I think there's evidence they are almost inherent to our way of thinking. There are three core rational beliefs. The first one is, is intrapsychic within ourselves. I must be a good person. I must do good. 
I must get the approval of it. So basically the first must is I must be good. Define good. That's the hard part. It's, it, it, it's, no, it's irrational. Right. And you can't be good. Because again, if you, like I said, if you were being good, literally everything you ever did would be evaluated as good by you, everyone else, under all conditions. Which brings it back to like, if like the Christian Bible, you're talking about like the, the prime example is Jesus Christ. And their yep. whole reasoning over that is you can't be that. Correct. You yeah, can't, and, and nobody can that, do that. That's where the algorithm works at as far as is that that's, yeah, the, whether it's a Muhammad or a Jesus, it's this perfect being on earth. That, that nobody can the, replicate. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you know, infinity that you can only approach. You never can achieve. Right. Um, but, yeah, so that's the first irrational. I must be good. The second one is inter, like interpersonal. You must be good and others must be good or else you're a bad person. Which your definition of good may be way different than my definition Correct. of good. So that makes that fucking impossible. So first irrational belief, which eventually that's the kernel belief that leads to all these other stupid philosophies we build. But as Ruth is, I must be good. I need to do good. It's just built into us. Yeah. And that belief gives birth to shame, guilt, anxiety, depression. You must be good. This is a real doozy. This gives birth to genocide, anger, rage. Because if you're bad, you're doing bad, you're a bad person. Yeah, we you must get rid of that. To, you deserve to be punished. By yeah. definition. By definition, you deserve to be punished. That's the, the third one gets really doozy. This is, this is life must be good. I must get what I want. I must not get what I don't want. This is existential. Which is an impossibility. It's unfair that I suffer. I don't deserve that. It's unfair that there's suffering in the world. That's not right. It's unfair that they're doing this to that. It's unfair that... But suffering in the world is just a part of the world. It's it, 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 Whether it, it, it clearly has been and is up to this point, whether, or not, yet. whether or not that condition has changed, it doesn't matter. It is what it is. Yeah. We don't have to like it. We don't have to just accept it. We, we don't have to... I'm sorry. We don't have to not do anything about it. But we better accept it unconditionally. So I'm saying, I'll accept that there's suffering in the world as long as you guys do the good thing. No. There's suffering in the world. And that's also subjective, but it is what it is. And you'd be better, because if you don't, that gives birth to addiction, despair, more depression. Like the, the, cause Because you're not ready to cope with any of these things well, that may happen, often, and they almost inevitably will happen. Often the shitty philosophy that comes from that is, well, it's all fucked anyway, so I might as well just fucking kill myself. Nihilism? Yep, nihilism. You combine that with... The second must. So these are the three musts. I must be good. Others must be good. Life must be good. Others must be good and life must be good. You suddenly deem yourself the warrior of good life and good people. And let's say you have an access to or personality disorder, narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial, whatever, Machiavellian, all that crap. You're going to do some really bad damage if you're influential. Because you're right. operating off of these global things. This is where cults form and collusion and fratricide and genocide and all that but these are the three and I mean, we can challenge this notion that they're um whether or not they are inherent to our thinking because we have to find someone somewhere who has not believed these things out of the gate and there probably is an evolutionary psychological advantage to have having having those built into our psyche but they are irrational and they're giving birth to a lot of unhealthy emotions and behaviors that not only affect ourselves, it affects others, and it even affects the ecology around. We start trying to change the environment to our liking and fuck shit up in the process. Yep. So that's the, yeah. So then there's a lot of threes in, I guess, in a lot of things. Um, so those yeah, to understand what's beneath our rational beliefs, it always goes back to that. So when you're trying to, like, fish through your thinking, like, oh, I'm depressed, what am I thinking about? Well, someone heard, yeah, someone heard my podcast, and like, oh, the audio, you're worried about the audio. Audio is shitty, you know, oh, this is never going, now I'm really fucking depressed. Like, does that happen? That may, And then, well, what are you saying to yourself? Well, I need to get the audio right, because I need, I can't, have people not liking it right and then like it's we, irrational we don't and, and this is normal now again because beneath that are rational beliefs 
I better have the audio right, because what the fuck, I'm trying to do this to make something of this, and I want people to like it, because what's the point, I might as well just talk to myself. Right. So, it's really important, I work as hard as possible to get, and this is all rational thinking. So that's going to translate to frustration when the audio doesn't work right, as opposed to anger. Anger and rage is going to start breaking everything, and now that didn't make the audio any better, did it? Frustration's like, all right. And I've gone through that stage where I threw a fucking camera and... Have, have you a know. wheel. Um, yeah. <laughs> many a skateboard have been broken before they were supposed to break. <laughs> um, that's true. Right? <laughs> so, Focus and decks. But that's that's why we get... We fool our brains... Our brains trick us to believing that must is uh, it would be better. So we got to get that must out. That it is what it is. It doesn't mean the world's going to end. The world's going to continue to spin. The audio is what it is. I don't need other people approving it. It just is what it is. And I don't have to like it either. It'd be kind of weird if I did. And even if I start making myself angry about it, which I am making myself angry because I believe that, and this is where that secondary disturbance, that's okay. Yeah. So don't start beating myself up, oh, I'm a fucking hothead, because that's to be expected. I do, I, I believe that these juices in my head mix with my life, it's real, all that, it, am, it amounts to something that I, I don't know anyone who just magically stops being angry. Even though I'm led to believe that this shit, this guy Dave talking about, works, and maybe it will, maybe it won't. But I better not upset myself over being upset. That gets back to the un- unconditional self-acceptance. Does it mean that you're like, I'm me, I get to do whatever the fuck I want? And it means that whatever I've done, whatever I'm doing, wherever I will, it is what it is. And I accept the fact that you made a mistake. It. And not accept on. it under the condition that I succeed in the future. It just, just accept it and pursue my goals. Same with others. Um, big thing is the parents and friends. Uh, there's nothing saying I shouldn't have been treated this way or these conditions I lived under should be, but it is what it is. I better unconditionally accept who those people are. Because if I inhabit their brain and I, you know, experience everything they experience, I literally would be behaving the same way. It doesn't right. mean I wouldn't want me to be stopped no more than I want them to stop, but it just means it is what it is. Same with life. I happen to come into a certain set of environmental circumstances. I was born in South Sudan under, you know, like, warfare. Or I was born into riches. Um, whatever it is. It is what it fucking is. Like, right. Traditionally. You can't change it. So you got to accept those things that can't be changed and move on and deal with Correct. it. Correct. I love the fact that you use the word better. That's, if we change our thinking from you better as opposed to you should, it's much more powerful. People think it's seen like, you should do that. You tell that to a kid enough times, like, well, I didn't do it, and I'm all right. As opposed to, you better do that. Because it's implying there are going to be consequences that we can measure. Right. It's going to be better for you to do it. Because, you know, much in the same way you realize that predictably, even though I said you should do it, you did it. Same way as when you did that thing you better have done, that bad shit kept happening, right? You better, you know, whatever. Um... Where the fuck? Wear a seatbelt or something that's going to result in a, a predictable outcome. Um, yes, yeah, so that's re- ar- even re-architecting our language, I believe, which is hard to do. Uh, it may not even be re- realistic to think to do, but I work a lot when I speak to use the word better and worse as opposed to should and ought and must. Because I, I believe that that will kind of help, again, re-propagandize the way I think to ground myself in reality. Um, knowing again that my brain is going to be, I'm going to make myself anxious, I'm going to make myself depressed, I'm going to make myself angry. It's just part of being human. And the way I'll be able to make myself less so is to try to keep identifying those lines of code in my brain that are irrational. In order to do that, it's important I just accept myself. And it's not hard to do because I'm like, who the fuck do I know who is making himself crazy? Right. And if I do, hats off to them. Yeah. Like They know something I don't. Yeah, and that's cool. Like, Maybe, Maybe learn from them. Yeah. But instead, we're like feeding ourselves up for not being the Ubermensch or uh, what the fuck? Superman. The Jesus. <laughs> I, I right back to Nietzsche. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so weird how Nietzsche, can, as I say, like, well, that's kind of sketchy sounding, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> mm. No, but I was actually thinking about that because this is like very. You, you've touched on certain points that are similar to that, that Ubermensch. Um, like archetype, if that's the right word. Yeah, no, um, it's, it's it's the 
perfect person. It's yeah, but it's the idea that you can make that out of yourself. Um, you can't For not anyone. not perfect, but like the best version of you you can possibly yeah. be. So probabilistically, here so a lot of people will I argue with over the idea of like universal morality. Mm-hmm. Um, and is I, there a such thing? I, there definitively can't be. Oh, there may be, but I don't think anyone's identified because there need to be some kind of source, some kind of compendium that when it's open and when it's practiced, all people will re- re- experience a predictable outcome that aligns with what we would say is moral. I think there are effective morals, meaning that if we audited the thinking of every single human being that exists on the planet at this point in time and identify an action that one would commit that all would evaluate as immoral. That's effectively moral. Like, that's an, an effective universal moral at this time. It's conventional. But over the course of time, this stuff may change. Under different conditions, this may change. Right. So, and, and the thing is, it doesn't, this gets back to, I, this gets back to another belief that humans have. I need certainty. I need to know. And the world isn't certain. You, well, you, if it is or it isn't, you don't need it. Because, and you know, here's the question, it's like, well, why do you need it? And then they start fumbling with all these rational rationalizations, not rash, rationalizations when you try to, like, make an argument in favor of something rather than provide evidence. Right. Well, how in the world wouldn't work, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, no, you don't, it, and, you know, maybe it would be better to have a universal memorial written time. Maybe it wouldn't. The only way to know is if it happens, but we don't need it. And, and here's the evidence. We haven't had it up to now, and the world's still spinning. Right. So why are we, like, looking for an event that we don't even know what the outcome is? Because seemingly the reason you want something is because it's going to give you something you've already experienced. If you haven't experienced that, what the fuck? Who knows? So anyway, that's the, uh, um, yeah, the need for certainty is another one we have in our brains. Um yeah, the universal morality. It, it, there's no, there are no, the only absolutes can abs, are the things that can absolutely be proven. Very few things that I know about. And it often is in the realm of physics. Like gravity seemingly is absolute. Like uh, with it, it uh, decelerates at negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And we can measure that. Now, in theory, there may be a place on this planet, I, 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 I'm very limited in my knowledge, where for some reason, Gravity doesn't go at that speed. And there's no other explanation. No condition, no friction, whatever. Then suddenly it's... It, but it doesn't matter. There's certain things we treat as effectively true. Um, but what matters in the case of but our it's, psyche, it's like true until proven false. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. I think it's less about proving things true, especially in the case of RG. It's proving shit false. Yeah. Falsifying. So we want to find everything. Like I, I, It's better that... We don't believe in the notion of good and bad people, but we do believe that there are things that we consider actions that are good and would want to do. We we actually pursue what we think we want better in that scenario than the other, because and this gets to the the guilt and shame thing I was talking about. These are the killers. The number one killer emotion is shame, and shame in, in the sense of how REBT would would define. And I, I'd say when a clinical definition of shame is being used effectively, it's the feeling you get predicated upon the false belief that you are a bad person. You're somehow flawed. There's something like inherently wrong. And when you hear people like shame, they'll say, I I just destroy everything around. I'm a piece of shit. I'm useless. And that often leads to like the big ones, like either, either suicide or some kind of like explosion. It's all resting upon the false belief that there even can be a good or bad person, or more importantly, that there can be a bad person. Shame will blind us because it's so psychically debilitating humans, we will do anything not to feel that, and that's where we do these desperate things. Um, we will, you know, so if we are making ourselves ashamed because we believe, because we fucked something up, and, and let, let's really take it to the nth degree. We did something really bad. It, I, you let, there's actually, um, I'll send it to you, a really cool old school lecture Ellis is doing on guilt and shame. He's like, well, All right. what's the worst you've done? Kill someone. It's like, well, it's probably not good that you did that, and you're going to experience consequences. You'll probably end up in jail. Yeah, but it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean, you know, or actually another statement, which really sums up Albert Ellis, um, to put it in context, a 
Jewish man who lived during the rise of Nazism in World War II. He says, I can honestly say I do not hate Adolf Hitler. Would I be willing to go into battle to take him out? Sure. Right. But, like, hating him is a pride for me saying he shouldn't be that way. He's just doing what he's doing. He is what he is. Doesn't mean we don't take him out or doesn't, whatever you want to do about it. If you want war, you get war. But, like, what matters is what you say about it. And again, if, getting back to what's more important that we call Hitler a That's baddie. heavy, too. That's right? heavy. We call him a baddie or we stop him from doing What if the answer to stop him from doing is he has to live in a room and eat his favorite food for the rest of his life? Even though he was a guy who did all this bad shit. But what matters is not only does it stop what he did, it undoes what he did. So every, every you know, action that he performed that resulted in the big genocidal stuff that earns him, you know, understandably earns him his title. Yeah. Like, the only way is to... It's some like weird sci-fi scenario where now he has to experience eternal pleasure for the rest of his life. But a lot, you can see a lot of people having pause. Well, wait a second, the guy who killed all those people. And Why would we do that? Because they're going to come back to life. Oh, I mean, to the point where some people may crazily sacrifice that opportunity because they have some weird rationalization because they're more caught up in the idea. Because if that happens, that means that their whole understanding of the world goes away. That means there isn't such thing as good and bad people, and then then how can I ever be a good person? And, and anyway, that's where the shame comes in. So, like, shame will stand in the way of addressing the brass tax issue. Like, the real shit. Like, getting, you know, stopping a habit that's that's defeating you. Stopping depression, anxiety. And that, again, the way to defeat shame is unconditional self-acceptance. Accepting what you have done what you are doing what you will do um defeating the belief that that you can even be a bad person and then just focusing on on the shit that you want to get done right so yeah so the shit <laughs> it's, it's good stuff but. it is that's i i definitely i have to get into this this is just yeah. just ha- hearing what you've touched on already on it is like uh it's completely reshaping the way I'm thinking about psychology because it's yeah. it's not it's it's almost like a I don't want to say for lack of a better term like dumbed down easier version of a big fucking book that you could read it, about everything and it's like you kind of notice just, how the shit that works the best is simple seems to be simple yeah right yeah it's it's effective because people can do it um without well, unlimited resources all the bullshit I like let's well, just bring it full circle back to the jujitsu. Yep. Seems to be tested to be probably one of the most effective martial techniques we have out there. Yeah. I do the traditional Chinese martial arts, which has lots of interesting theory and movement behind it. And and again, that I specifically say traditional because it's tied to the actual, not the McDojo stuff. But when it comes to two people competing in a ring to literally submit someone. That stuff, there's so much complex shit and you know, meditation and all these movements and Tai Chi and praying mantis and all that. All that matters is whether it works or not. And even, even the stuff on this front, the Chinese stuff, as basis, the fundamentals are really simple. Make sure your stances are strong, your body is strong, your roots strong, you're as healthy and physically, you know, you're flexible. All the other movements is secondary. But, um, yeah, but anyway, but the fundamental of jiu-jitsu is it's not, it's not like an ultra-complicated thing. Right. Like, here's how you do this. It gets complicated. People that bring it all together, but the vocabulary beneath it is, is very obvious and straightforward. It's the same with REBT gets complicated when it's like, all right, I know I'm making myself feel these things. I know I'm thinking right. Now i got to actually do it. i gotta right. fight. I got to fight with my fucking brain that wants me not to face up to these things to get it on paper so I can argue it. And I got to do that successfully until I can measure myself not having that emotion. I've had uh, people say, you know, people close to me, um, it's like say you read all this complex psychological material like Carl Jung and, and Freud and these, like you get, you, you seem to really understand the concepts, but you can't apply them. That's normal with everything. Though. You know what I mean? But it's exactly what you're saying, where it's like, yeah, I can, I can fucking tell you one thing, yeah. but if I'm not, I'm not able to apply it, what good is it? You well, know what I mean? And I, that's not to say that those things aren't good, because they are good, but it's more along the lines of how I'm practicing these well, things. Well, especially when it gets 
obscured in all this like beautiful language and complexities. And it's like, and, and you lose sight of why am I even reading this? It's why am I even into this? Because I want a predictable result, which is kind of simple. I just want to feel anxious less of the time. Yeah, I want to feel better. I basically want to feel depressed and anxious. And I like to even put into specific terms: anger, depression, anxiety. I'd say the number one that we will mostly struggle with is anxiety, which often gives birth to depression and plays interplays with anger. And there are lots of things that can be misdiagnosed um, that actually the root of the cause is anxiety. Yeah. Well, that's the, you were talking a lot about the ADD and ADHD. And yep. when I was running a clinic, a pharmacological assessment clinic for kids, as well as my internship was dealing with a lot of kids who were diagnosed with it, it looked a lot more like anxiety. And in a lot of instances, panic level anxiety was the operative issue with lack of concentration there was some like magical you know uh vigilance decrement or something because they didn't have enough meth in their brain not not, not to say properly prescribed when it all worked and but they literally have to fucking experiment on the kid well, to that, get it to that, that point so it was cool that's why i ran the clinic all this stuff was um software based so the, the whole goal was the least amount of juice in the kid's body, because they're getting it either way, and we want to measure the outcome. It's the most obvious thing. We, we, we put them on tasks that we can measure kids on and off these simple tasks to see how long they can maintain their attention for. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's nothing else out there like that. It still isn't, cause it, probably because it kills the whole model. It was easier to say, give them eight. There's less money in it. Well, also, there's a lot of pressure from the schools. And, and in some ways... They just want you to, the kid well, to sit down and shut the fuck up. Especially when a teacher has like 30 kids in a class. And yeah. This kid like Public school, fast, baby. Like, yeah. And, and, That's and, how I got on that medication, yeah. you know? And, 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 I, and like, they tried Ritalin, Concerta, whatever yeah, the... And, and, you know, the stuff works. There's a reason kids will take Adderall to write yeah, but it, papers. Yeah, but it worked diminishing to sit me down and shut me the fuck up. But and I had exactly. zero personality. All that, like, creative juice that I had, I would... Dude, yeah. I was the kid that was in school fucking drawing on the back of my test, like, after I washed through it. Yeah. And, and, and the, my guess, from what you described, was just similar to me. It was more a function of you have a very rigorously active thought process. Which yes, leads to it never things. stops. And and then you mix that with environmental stressors that you've dealt with, and so mi in the mix of all the the rational beliefs that lead like I want something better, there's I need to be better. You know, it's like, I was also getting a lot of um like the half the reason as I'm getting older, I'm starting to realize half the reason I would turn that paper over and start drawing on it is because I got a lot more attention for drawing cool shit yeah. well, than so I got from you, making an A. Did you find also when you were doing it helped you concentrate more because you were tying up? Because I, I, that's why when I drew, so even when I talk to people sometimes, I'll engage if, because like my, I'll trip myself up. I'll like think faster than I'm able to speak by doing an activity like drawing or you'll see me like kinetically moving. Henry, like the martial arts shit or playing video games. You're talking with your hands. It, it, it. Ties up enough of my brain so then I can slow down and concentrate to other people, other um, stuff that's going on conversationally. Yep. So, but it's it's something to get that little extra energy out while you're fucking overthinking yeah. and overanalyzing everything that's in I, front of you. More, more. Often, Look at the notes that I'm. Yeah, and to, and just to come back to something I'm thinking these, about. A lot of these things are just anxiety management stuff. And it's not some magical... Which has taken me almost 30 years to figure out. But yeah, it's, And I'm not figuring it out. You're telling me it. I still haven't had well, it figured no, out. It, it, no one's really figured it out. But this is, a, and this is all my you know, subjective analysis. But it did appear a lot, a lot of what was called attention deficit. Meaning that like there was nothing else other than this weird neurological condition that's causing a person not to be able to concentrate. Which was weird. It was always partial. It's like, well, they can concentrate on this, but not on that. And now some people, it was more, very rare, but they just could not concentrate. And there was no rhyme or reason to it. Now that we've ruled out that there's no adverse circumstances, which would inspire anxiety in a kid, or something that's going to be weighing on their head, now I'm open to that. But until I stop reading, like... You know, mom's boyfriend is beating the kid regularly, and it's like, 
And at school, the kid, like, is really easily distracted. It's like, yeah, because this kid's dealing with a lot of fucking shit. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't even have He's to be... He's fucking walking on eggshells for his entire existence. Correct. And that's, that takes up a lot of payload in one's head. It's, now, and they'll say, well, why is the other sibling that? Well, it does seem that the way they deal with things cognitively, they're not... They're more, like, in their body and less in their head... Which comes with other weird shit that comes out. So that's probably why they're not distracted because they're they're almost like in a weird. Or some people dissociate. Um, for better or for worse, it gives you some ability to like sometimes lose focus or sometimes remain focused. I think some of that was the drawing aspect of it too, because I grew up in like kind of a dysfunctional household, um, and like my parents split up when I was three. You know, yeah. not even, like, two and change. So it's like that from a very young age, it was, like, a lot of confusion. They were yeah. fucking fighting all the time. Say, yeah, and you, as early as you were online, you were taking in all of this behavior. Other people's pain. Yeah. You know? And, and again, now, a lot of people will run and say, well, that created that in you. But, like, now, because you couldn't think abstractly at that age. In fact, we really can't until we hit adolescence. Mm-hmm we're basically going to believe whatever we see and what we're told. And this is where we're starting to learn our rational beliefs. So if we're told there's such things as good, and, you know, boys and girls and all that shit, and there's this must and that. Some people, again, I would say the punk mind, the martyr mind, not, not the anti-authority, but the anti-authoritarian, meaning that they see a truth, they're like, that doesn't make any sense. It won't get through to them. That's, That's very rare. That's been me my whole life. That preserved you. A lot of people you'll see in similar environments they end up becoming cult fodder. Meaning, not that they're a little cult, like they, most people, which again makes sense. They're looking to fill a void. Evolutionary psychology, it, it feel that, I don't even think they're thinking it. They need that authority there to provide um, direction, which makes sense because you don't, you don't want a bunch of, uh, goats running around. <laughs> right. You know, and it doesn't mean the sheep, it's not better or worse. Like, I, I would uh, argue that being naturally inclined, this would be in, in the big five, like trait openness being high, that puts you, you're in line with the path of progress and pioneering, but as we know, historically, most pioneers end up dead on the Oregon Trail. Now, hats off to them for doing that but if and everyone like wants to be the person who makes it to the end and gets the gold and all that shit and that's i think that's the kind of obsession with pro- progressivism and progress as people will talk about it they may wrap it up in the, again the good and the bad stuff but i think at the end of the day it's they want to be the person who's the individual who makes things better by going outside the box it's a great path to be on if you're also, this probably would be, you have high conscientiousness. Yeah. Now, now, that doesn't mean necessarily everything you're conscientious about. It means that when you're locked onto something that's meaningful, you could have high, con- meaning that you're going to do the job until it gets done. Um, and then if you're low neurosis, which is very rare, th- this is this is the kind of person you want going out there. But most people we want to take, you know, Peter's on something, the more conservative approach. It doesn't mean conservative like, Go to church and don't say the F word. It's let's first stick with what is provably working before you run out there. You know, they need a plan. Before you go over the edge of the, the trench and start charging the enemy, like that probably what it likely is going to take to win this because we've been at this. We've been stagnant. We've been doing this conservatively and we've been in this trench for a year. It's probably going to take some crazy motherfucker to go over the edge to push us forward. That's the rare one. But we are all not this. If we all run over the edge and say, progress, we're fucking dead. Yeah. <laughs> and now none of us are alive. Now, the <laughs> one who usually is, the, the person who is anchored to, again, not politically conservative, meaning that they are, like, I'm going out into the unknown, so I really better have a strong grasp on my fundamentals and no one to anchor in. They're going to probably make it. Yeah. Or they're not. I'm sorry. They probabilistically will make it because the other person is like, progress is great. Therefore, wherever I go, it's gonna work. You know, falling all over the place. Right. So I don't know how the fuck I got on that one, but that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah, we were talking about like yeah how your high in trade openness to drawing and and uh, preserved you because all the irrational orthodoxies that 
would probably be, be feel very comforting to someone who's trying to contend with a chaotic environment. You have the risk of grasping onto one that's just going to send you in another stupid direction because most orthodoxies are. Because by definition, an orthodoxy just says like this is the right way to do it. Stick to the fundamentals. If you deviate from it, you're wrong. Right. So it's being very rigid in your views and taking. Well, that that's it. That's that's the ri- the rigidity is the conservative part, and then the not the anti-authoritarian is the progressive part. Like when it's when it's really functioning properly, you're anti-authoritarian, meaning you're anti any concept or group that is saying this is the right way, even though it may prove to predictably be the one, but not just because they're saying it. Right. Because good people do that. And so that's all going to be on layers of definitive false statements, provably false statements. You allow people to earn authority through competence. Peter's going to talk about that often, like the competence. merit-based. Yeah, and that—that's. I mean, the, the, if there was ever anything that describes, excuse me, it's about politics. I can't stand that shit. Like as if you choose to be part of a party, one or another. Like you think what you think, and you may say you believe something, but really what matters is what do you believe in. And as far as I'm concerned, is what of these beliefs are rooted in irrational thinking or not? Um, or is it that tribal brain? Yeah, exactly. Are you riding tribal brain? Are you, you know, are you, are you the music listener? Or are you the culture? You know, what what is it? Is is you want to actually experience the content and and experience it for what it is and evaluate it in a pure form, or do you want to just evaluate it through the lens of what other people are thinking? Right. And how many, like honestly, how many fucking politicians have you seen in your lifetime? Um, That's that... why I never voted. <laughs> Probably never will. So somebody, I one of my friends was at, at jujitsu. Actually, he he asked me um, last uh, election period. He asked me if I was gonna vote. He's, are you gonna go out and vote today? And I said no. If, if I, and I didn't skip a fucking beat. I said if voting mattered, they wouldn't allow us to do it. Cool. And he looked at me like what? Yeah, well, and that's in. To I, me, to I get me, the nuances beneath it too, because it's it's you know I I think a lot of the vote is especially in areas that aren't we'll say battleground states it's a gesture which I think does have importance to people and that's good um, from my standpoint. Regardless of whether it's rigged or you know like the like you said like they they wouldn't have us vote if if it worked or whatever I I don't even even know how to wrap my head around that like how do you do it scientifically speaking but conceptually speaking I I see it as a vote of confidence in someone or something so I would just naturally without even being coaxed vote for someone or something that I have high confidence will yield the outcome or at least uphold a certain level of um, behaviors and principles that resonate with what I believe are going to yield what I want more of the time. But there's always at least one fucking bait and switch. And I, I think a lot of that may just be circumstance of the nature of politics it's right. not necessarily like a whole council gets together and we're gonna you know obfuscate everything with propaganda and well, they have these big fucking teams in the white house you know what i mean it, just that's our politics never mind the world scale yeah, and but. I, I, I imagine a lot of this is just a function of modern technology and particularly information tech where people just have access to so much information so often that to contend with that to try to get something you know, because they're trying to shrink this down to an on-off button, yay or nay. Right. This party is good, this party is it, There's a lot it, more nuance. It's, it's new, and, and the nuance is available to everyone now. Right. It used to be, you know, I'm assuming, well, I was almost happy with no information. It, 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 it almost as if, like, well, that person is a top, you know, is saying X, Y, and Z, and I only know X, Y, and Z is happening, therefore that's my person. That, that's easy. the thing that that is aggravating, though, is to, is that there are these available nuances, and you can do your research, you can do your, uh, uh, you can figure out who who is who uh, politically through history and through yeah. all these different things, but people still use to choose that 
fucking monkey brain. Yeah. Well, and and, and, and even empathizing with a person who be, is a politician or an aspiring politician, like seeing if there is how, like how what would they do to not play the game? It's like, it almost seems like you know they say play the game. How with all the money and influence, like there's just so many things. I think, again, our more primitive brain is thinking in terms of should. Well, a good politician should stick to their guns and think this is... But will they? Well, no. Can they? What kind of human can handle that level of payload? And they're navigating all these realities. Talk about being... I I just don't... I don't even know... I can imagine being in that position. Just the mundane things they have to deal with on a regular level basis is taking up so much time and energy, let alone we're getting to, like, this is the person who's going to, like, change the economic landscape of our country for history. Right. I don't care. And, and that's why I see time and time again, you go and, you know, I have a candidate who co- seems very convincing in their ideals, and they get in and they can't do much. And that may be for good reason. I think that it, it seems like the system, system or our government functions the best when not much is happening. You want... Like, you don't want radical, sudden changes. Or maybe, you know, I know some people do, and I, I, I imagine they think those changes are good if they do indeed come with a positive outcome. But again, like that, everyone being a pioneer thing, these crazy changes historically proven more often than not to end in crazy bad shit happening. Right. So, but it seems like, you know, you have a major a president or a candidate come in, and the government kind of sits at a... Not a standstill, but they're they're like some things are moving here, some things the parties are kind of, you know, keeping in one another in check. To me, that seems like a more functional system, and I almost think the more, it, you know, based on what I understand, a you know, a democratic republic or a country like ours to be, until the public can be less dysfunctional amongst one another as citizens and communicate, especially now with all the ability to talk to one another and, and really figure it's driven out... driven the division a more. Fight, fight it, and I don't want to sound too like cheesy and cliche, but like fight the tribal thing. It's it's more be honest with ourselves with what we want and, why, and more importantly, why we want it and figure out where there's overlap with other people. Forget about who they are or what they identify as. Right. And like all that matters is there's this one thing that's important to me and I want to see if someone else convincingly believe the same and and that's that's where we intersect and eventually the public is going to identify getting to this like universal morality thing we're talking about they're going to identify certain issues certain topics that just statistically speaking most people most of the time are very interested in preserving and that's now, and it's a cycle. It goes through the, every four yeah, years. Well, you hear the again, same well, stories. And, and I, I, you know, again, that's that's the flip side. So what I'm describing historically would be near impossible, but now maybe it is possible because we have the ability to audit the interests of every single human being at every given time. So imagine, rather than voting for the president or a politician, the politician has to make a commitment to uphold a certain stance on certain issues. And each individual at any given time, in the privacy of their own home or on their own, can indicate where they stand on each of these key can Identify what their key issues are and indicate where they stand on them. With a le- It wouldn't even be an A or B. It would be like a confidence. I'm 80% confident that I think uh, the Second Amendment is a good thing to uphold. Or I'm... Ninety percent confident that other hot button issue. And at any given time, any citizen can see where every single citizen stands on a certain issue, and we'll just know right away. This will obviously pull the curtain back on political parties because yeah. it will render them useless. But uh, in a in a similar note, it would it would drive the voter themselves to be a little bit more competent well, also the public, on the issues. The public would take control of the political destiny of the country, the right. part, which seemingly is the way they want it to work. Or, in, you know, to me, that seems like a much more interesting proposition. I know it's not happening probably because it's, it's very unrealistic, but 
it would be interesting to move in that direction. And in a weird way, maybe it is with like the long form podcast. That's why people talk about being politically homeless and all that. And I think it's because whether people believe it or not, they don't. It's impossible to identify. Yeah, the idea of like, especially you have two political parties. Like I'm this party. And I've been a lifelong, whatever, Democrat or Republican. But we know over the course of a long life, the positions of those parties change. So did your positions magically shift internally to fall beautifully in line with this party? Right. Or are you stubbornly saying, I'm part of this hell or high or, again, because I must be good. I must be part of the good people. I need approval of others. So Monkey when I, brain. When I signal my D or R, I'm waiting for the thumbs up or thumbs down, which literally is baked into our fucking social media. Yep. It's all built upon that false notion that I need the approval of others, and I need the approval of others because I must be good, and more importantly, I must not be bad. So, again, if those two things shattered, then it's, I feel no need to identify with a political party because whether you think it's awesome or not is really irrelevant. What's more important to what me are they is, doing? What what can we do right now to learn more and make things better? What do we even want? Do you even know what you want? Right. Probably not. That's a bigger question. Yeah. Do you even know why the D or R is a... Well, it's because of this and that. Really? Have, have you thought about it deeply? Clearly not, because as we see you guys, you know, talk online, it's, there's a lot of ums and uh, I haven't really thought about this one. So, anyway, big tangent there, but that's... Yeah. That's a good one. That's where I stand with that stuff. Um, and, yeah, the punk in me just wants to, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, say the, yeah, I'm thinking in terms of like, the politics stuff amongst friends is, is to say the thing they least want to hear because it's hilarious to watch your reaction. Um, <laughs> you like to watch people squirm. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> And, or hopefully it gets them thinking, like, why the hell do I even take this position anyway? Yeah. But, you know, they, most people are going to be fucking upset. That's yeah. about it. It's, it's the most I get out of a lot of people uh, in political conversation, unfortunately, because it becomes, like, I, I, I try so hard not to take a side. I try to just question the core values and beliefs of the person that's fucking yeah. talking. And it never works out. And I think most people, if they really are being honest, want that to be the case for themselves too but because we have this i believe at least we have this baked in need i need the approval of others and more importantly the approval of others i hold important to deem important it will grate right up against what you describe you can't think for yourself if you hold that belief you can't because the two can't exist because if if you need the approval of others, you're ultimately going to be governed by whatever you believe will give you that approval now there may be a case you made that it's very and it is true it's very important that you get approval from others on certain things because there may be consequences if you don't and it doesn't matter what your internal ethos is but that's a practical matter not an emotional one i mean even at a small level as musicians you're 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 going to look at things like you want the approval of the crowd you're playing in front of yeah otherwise well, you do get a beer bottle chucked at your head correct and, and there just may, you know, you or let's say the punk thing. Like, this is an interesting thing with the whole freedom of expression and speech thing. And, you know, where it's just, it's, it's actually, that's a whole other conversation. That's one of the <laughs> we'll punk save teams. that for next time. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, like, if you want to, like, imagine, can we have another GG? I, I feel like, actually, now may be the point where the next GG Allen can be born because stuff is so tight wound. There are so many things that you quote unquote can't say and do and more interestingly in the punk scene they're saying you can't do the area that's which crazy to think about but you're right right now that that was that was always the case the punk scene always even when Gigi allen came there were still things that you can and can't say according to you know Gigi allen stepped all over that yeah and that's you know it takes a particular type of person to do that it took me a long time to realize like like a, he clearly was suffering from some mental things. Oh, yeah, well, his, his, his child, upbringing was insane. He lived in like a... a he was born Jesus Christ Allen. Yeah, and not to mention he lived in like a, a house with no running water that was like packed with snow in the with winter. With a tyrant of a father. Yeah. And, and a mother who like, just went along with things. Yeah. Um, There's actually some interesting interviews that came out lately with his brother, Merle. It's a, yeah, on uh, Soft White Underbelly. Yeah, those are I've fantastic. seen those. Those are great. 
Dude, what a fascinating family. Yeah. Um, I, I love shit like that. Well, that's the other thing, too, is I love, like, anytime someone describes a character that, oh, this person's worse, I immediately want to learn about them. Not because why? I want to prove they're bad, because, again, like, in my mind, they can't be very good. First, often, especially now, the first thing I think is, all right, where is this story distorted? And secondly... Because everything gets blown out of proportion, and, and, especially and when people e- don't like something. Even if there is shit in there that, like, I personally may not like, uh, it's not going to stop me from... Like, I'm actually curious. I'm, I'm, I mean, we all have that. Like, I'm why curious. do you think this way? What is it yeah. that made you think that way? I just like different... That's the part of what is attractive about punk is. Right. What is the most... You're not going to get extreme stuff without extreme... Personalities. ...behaviors and personalizing viewpoints. And, yeah, and surprise, surprise, beneath all the stuff that results in bad actions is what I'm describing. Those three must. I must be good. Others must be good. Life must be good. And that's not unique to one type of person or another, regardless of what they identify politically, religiously. It's in all of us to think irrationally. So to... Yeah, to, to deem myself better than someone else because they think the wrong thing or do things, again, that I may want to seek justice against doesn't make them better or worse than me. Mm. It just means they're doing shit that I think, you know, as far as, you know, I'm concerned, as far as what I resonate with internally and, and, and the information I have available to me, I have high confidence that they're doing things that are not in my best interest and my best interest also may may which is true i want it to not infringe upon other innocent people's pursuit of happiness and if i'm in any position to stop that i will but doesn't make me any better or worse than them right. doesn't make me good doesn't make them bad it just means they're doing something which may turn out oh shit they were actually doing something that turned out it was going to be good isn't that weird that that's also the the hubris like do we really think this whole notion of the right side of history like, we finally found it. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're not going to be that asshole who, as history progresses, like, oh, I guess if there is a right side, as far as I'm concerned, that wasn't it. Yeah, there's, there's always going to be a point in time where they're looking back on something and going, hmm, was that really the right way to be? Yeah. No, that's, uh, it's hubris. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, tell me if I have talked you into a, I have no idea how long we've been doing this. Uh, I'm blind. It's 4.30. We've gone a couple hours. So, the thing you hours. probably have already learned with me is there's no stopping me, so you have to yeah, stop I'm kind of the same way. Do we want to end it here, and then we'll fucking pick it up on another episode at some point? Yeah, I, I think pro- probably more so for the... Uh, for the, the listeners, the of listeners <laughs> both of us will sit here for a week who, and not who knows eat. If they've gotten this far, yeah. Any any time I'm well any day. I'm, I'm happy because I've literally been waiting for this conversation. I didn't know it was gonna happen online, but yeah. I've been waiting for this conversation since I met you because we oh. literally will meet at jujitsu and fucking talk I for know. twenty minutes until either your wife or your phone goes off or yeah. so like. Something gets gets have, like children to tend to. Yeah. Or, or we have a class to do. Yeah. No. I mean, I I am happy this. On Your wife has actually camera. physically pulled you away from our roles before. Yeah. So. Oh, and and, and, and to her uh, uh, credit and testament to my love and and devotion to her is, is she's like us. She loves to talk and think. And so if she's pulling me away. It's probably because we well, no we have a child that needs to be fed. Or that something. yeah, that's important. <laughs> or worse, a turd's in the diaper and that's got. <laughs> but uh. Yeah, no, she actually may be an interesting person to have on a conversation too. Sure. Yeah, maybe next time if if I'm still around, uh, I'm I'm yeah. Well, you're in Austin. Texas, we, have, yeah. we have pals in Austin, so we'll be there oh, too. Oh fuck yeah, dude, that's awesome. Yeah. You like barbecue, by the way? I hope you do. I'm gonna. I haven't had real barbecue yet, but you I mean, I I've had smoked meat, so but not Texas barbecue. Terry Blacks. The big one I'm already is, going. My, I got plans to go with my friend. I said that's the first beef, thing I'm going to do to repay him for all the shit he's rib, done for me. Beef rib is that's what you got to do there. I've never been to Franklin because I had like a long line, but I suppose that's number one. The best I've ever been though is in Fort Worth, Goldies. All right. I think it was in Fort Worth, near Fort Worth. I'm that, pretty sure that's where Pantera well, is from, right? Or Dallas or Fort Worth? Dallas, well, Dallas, Fort Worth, the same kind of like the same vicinity. Okay. But holy shit, yeah, that's. I'll, if if you're out there on the we'll video, we are getting barbecue, sir. <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you. Likewise. Anytime. I really appreciate you coming by, man. And 
we will definitely pick this up on another episode because I have way more questions and I know we both have more to yeah, talk this about. Is, this is a fraction of a percent of what I believe I can offer and hopefully it's of interest to people. I hope so. That is fun. Thank you, man. Cool.